like tremendously. So I figured, like, oh, I'm gonna have a little something, something. Yeah. What did you have when when uh, you found out that uh, Biden had got the the election officially? Ooh. Oh, and that pineapple I had. Oh, that was uh, I had cut a hey brother, I had cut out a pineapple, right? And I usually always try to save them when I get it. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna use it, have me a little drink in it. I put uh, some crown, uh, OJ, and I think I put something else in it, like a few ice cubes to kind of keep it cold. It was pretty tasty. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I mean, if, I mean, you know. Getting Trump ass up out of there was made it even sweeter, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was some crown in there. It was crown in there, yeah. Yeah, that's it was uh, that was a time for like Saturday was wild, man. There was a lot of celebrating done, mm-hmm. and um, well, I guess we're gonna extend it to this episode of In the Building. Uh, welcome everybody uh, who joined us in on uh, on uh, YouTube. And everything, uh, you know. Uh, hope y'all enjoy this show. We are uh, doing our first show with uh, our first show post, or uh, technically post uh, Trump. It's you post know, Trump. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I, I mean, he, he's holding on to the presidency with his little hands for, for <laughs> their life, you know. But but he, he it's not working out and uh we know it's not going to work out we we're going to be able to all move on uh pretty soon officially yeah. but uh the, you know the 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 everything the the trans the transition team is, is being set up and everything now for Biden he's starting to get his people set up and you know it, i think part of this is part of i think what is is fun, if, though, for lack of a better term, about seeing this though, it's seeing that it this really has hurt Trump. You know, I was holding out some hope that he might have just been, he might have already just zoned out and been like, ah, oh, whatever, take it, and he would have just gave up. But he he really, you know, with a person like him, he just finds a way to always live down to his worst. Uh, the, his worst expectations, mm. and um, you know he he really he really just has, has come through again with uh, putting out the worst in himself, and his little buddies has uh that just backed him up and kept gassing them up, and you know it, it it's, it's 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 led to some some unexpected hilarity, like the stuff with uh them booking the Four Seasons and and wind, winding up in the parking lot next to the sex shop. Yeah, but that's that's really a perfect way to end the Trump presidency, man. How bad did that Trump, that sex shop have to feel to have them jackasses next to them? Sex shop just do it. This, <laughs> well, this fine. They I mean, they do it good. just fine, and then they gotta bring the ass over there. You bring down the value of the neighborhood. We do well, it. Just fine. They, bring, they did bring, <laughs> bring down the value. <laughs> well, Patty, they getting some business though, because they they get some good, good, good. business. So that good. they getting something out of it, but. My man flows at the Lini on uh, Twitter. He said it looked like the spot in the Sopranos where they hung out the the uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the meat shop. Oh yeah, I'm like I like Giuliani probably wanted to go get some gabagool after the uh, after he did the the press conference. But man, but that, that this just been it's just been that's just the, the kind of thing this week has been. It's been some hell, some. Hilarity has been a lot of seriousness, but I think mm-hmm. overall we got a, a weight that's lifted off of us now as Americans and as you know, you know, as conscious thinking Americans, you know, it's a lot that we got to to ride with, and you know, and now a little bit of that is is, is lifted off. Not everything. We still got to keep watch uh, on a lot of things. We got to keep make sure that uh, Biden and Harris and all them live up to things that. That they're going to be uh, right. promising us, so you know the the struggle never ends. But it's just it's a lot better now, at least in the near present, mm-hmm. uh, in the near future, I should say, in the present going forward, knowing that this destructive, idiotic force is not going to be uh, <laughs> dictating the direction of our nation. But uh, 
Yeah, but before I get off on any other of that, man, let's let's introduce our guest for this week, man. You can see his name right there, Mr. Gabriel Wilkins. He's uh one one. He's like, see, our guest today. We're gonna uh, Dave apparently is gonna be late coming in. We we'll see if he joins us or or if the kids hijack him. You know, <laughs> he may not join us this hour. I don't, we'll see, but. And um, you know, rookies out there in the mist somewhere. You know, we'll see <laughs> if he comes back sometime soon. But Gabe is is a is a great dude, man. He's a, a broadcaster himself and a writer, and uh, you know, got a lot of good stuff to say online as well. We'll shout him out for that in a little bit. But uh, Gabe's main uh, main focus on this of appearing with us is, uh, this week is has to do with. Him working as in the as a vote, you no, know, I guess vote taker or what? What was your what was your exact role? Vote like? taker. <laughs> I don't know. I'm there. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah. take that vote from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. well, well, he was he was working though from before. You know, he was doing the early vote stuff and all that. Mm. You know, in Chicago, he and uh, you know, just yeah, this, this fill us in on what you were doing. And uh, with the early vote process and everything. But anyway, before we do that, let, let's bring Dave in. He's here now. Oh, so. Dave here? Yeah. yeah. There he is. With the, yeah, with the. Uh oh, wait a minute. He's still having some issues. Oh, <laughs> all right. There you no, go. I'm good now. I did have a horizontal hold again. I was using my wife's computer. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, I was trying to use my wife's computer, but it's so old. The Mozilla on it has to be updated for StreamYard. Oh. So that was what kind of, yeah, it's a super old, uh, you, on your phone? you know, MacBook Air. Yeah, so I'm on my phone. All right, you, yeah. you good, man. We could hear yeah. you quite well. So, yeah, you all but, good. Uh, yeah, I'm just introducing everyone to Gabe. And, um, Gabe. you know, he's going to tell, oh, yeah, tell us now about his, uh, you know, it is what's that? Some ginger beer or something you got, man? No, nah, man. No, nah, it's, it's uh, that's nah, root, root beer. Root beer. Just root beer. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. yeah. But take take you another sip. We are gonna let Gabe speak on on his I'll, work. Oh, sure. By all means. His, on his work for the <laughs> for the election and stuff. So, yeah. What's up, man? Uh, tell tell us how you doing, man, and uh, and what will happen with you with the election. So. Basically, first and foremost, thanks uh, for having me on. But yeah, I, yeah. I was I was an election official for over the course of the early voting period up into election day, and I did a little bit of everything. Uh, I was leading the poll lines. Um, I got to tell you that I was a vote taker, okay. like when they had the ballot box scanner. Yeah, there. Good. The time, I, I, you know, I was letting people, you know, cast their ballots, helping them do that. Um, Working the floor, flying around, trying to, you know, help the elderly with the touch screens because that was one thing that I don't think a lot of people were hit to who were doing early voting for the first time is the fact that there are only touch screen machines at these polling sites for early voting. So we had to do a lot of things with the elderly, making sure that they, you know, were assisted. And whenever they was running into problems with, you know, either printing a ballot or with a voter card that they had what they needed. But that's that's pretty much what I was doing. I heard a lot about it um, as far back as February, prior to the primary. And they were talking about at the Chicago Board of Elections, according to you know what I was hearing on the news, that they were in need of a lot of young officials to work the poll because they were understaffed. And me, being a registered voter that's under the age of 30, I wanted to see how the system worked. So that was the thing that attracted me to it was I wanted to see how the system worked. And then I looked at it and I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know, this is a big election, big year with everything that's going on. I'm like, why not do it? So I tried my hand at it with the March primary where I just worked specifically in March. And then I had a chance of taking a key back to the 21st Ward receiving station which was on Vincennes and Mahalia Jackson. So when I went over there, I'm just looking around and I'm paying attention to everybody that's present. And I see a lot of elderly individuals working the poll, which I expected, but I was like, it's not too many young people. So that's what really got me attracted. It was like, okay, 
you know, with this being an election, and, and that's when the pandemic was fresh, and no one really knew, you know, what proper protocol was at the time. But I just looked at it for myself. Was like, you know, a man that stands for 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 nothing or fall for anything. So I was like, I just wanted to be a part of it, and be out on the front line, you know. That way, when I looked everything up, and I like for the board of elections, like several months later, they were looking for early voting officials, and I just hopped on it like right away. Hmm. So, Gabe, let me let me ask you a question, Gabe. So now, since sure. you've done it once before, do you uh, are you expecting to do it two years from two years later? Because obviously, you know, saying it's like basically every two years we have elections throughout the country. Uh, so, have you been bitten with the bug? As far as politics, as far as just kind of working this side of the aisle, as far as the day-to-day -day operations, as far as like getting people out to the polls or uh, helping people out in, in different precincts, or do you think it's going to get to the point of you know what, man, I'm I'm seeing this, I'm getting the understanding of it, I'm on the inside, maybe I might want to run myself for a position. I never have had an interest in running for politics, but I just have always, you know, for political office. And it's actually yeah. kind of funny you asked me that because, like, my interest in politics actually started when I was younger because my father went to college at SIU with Howard Brookings. It pledged mm. Alpha by Alpha with him. So when I found that out, you know, and I put two or two together, when I met him, it was interesting. Like, as soon as he got elected when I was a little child, and then, like, about a year later, I did a contest where I wrote about you know, being against secondhand smoking and the importance of why, you know, that should, like, it, it, it could be a, a harmful to, like, citizens. And I actually was, like, all of them for a day. But oh, and I got to meet like, the politicians and stuff like that. I, I've never been interested in that, though. I've always been interested in trying to do, like, the work in the field. And I just felt like this year was that time. Like, I saw so many of my peers talking about the election and how, you know, they were telling people to go vote, go vote, go vote. And I'm like, we always tell everybody to go vote, but there are a lot of people who don't necessarily know their rights to vote. Even myself as a registered voter, it was a lot of things that I learned just being a part of this election from the primary all the way to the general one that I didn't even know myself as a registered voter. So it was a very educational experience for me. And it was something that I wanted to learn from myself so that way I could kind of help my peers in addition to other people who were seeking to either get registered to vote for the first time, if not knowing what they needed to have, because you had so many people requesting vote by mail ballot. Like I can recall getting like 25 to 50 or just seeing 25 to 50 vote by mail ballots at my early voting polling site at Turner Drew on 90. Third in Princeton. And it was amazing to me how like so many people were just submitting the vote by mail ballots, but they didn't know that in order to vote in person, you needed a voter affidavit form that like which would be handed to you on site that you had to right. fill out in order to cancel that vote by mail ballot to vote in person. So to me, it, it was just more of an experience where I got a chance to help people. Do I think I'll do it again? I don't know, but I do know that I was very intrigued by it and that if the opportunity presented itself and depending on what I met within, you know, in my life within the next couple of years, I wouldn't mind doing it again. Gabe, how many how, how many how many kickbacks did you get for your day when you was an alderman? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get many kickbacks at all. It just was like <laughs> it was like 50 kids. Head picked across the city, but the cool part about it was it just getting the chance to actually see your officials throughout the city and meet with them face to face to see what they go through. Mm -hmm. And that for me was like I was 11 at the time, and I'm 27 now, so that alone was like a experience for me that I'll never forget. And it taught me that it's way more that comes with it than just like publicity and having your face on television and having notoriety in your neighborhood and so forth. Um, you know, like a lot of my friends always say, cause I have an interest in knowing my rights as a voter and voters' right. They always say, well, like, why have you ever thought about running for office? I'm like, no, nah, not really. But then I, you never know what life may bring. So you never know, man. It's not, it. it's not just about running for office either. It's 
having that uh, that ability to understand the system and the processes that we go through True. to enact our our rights as citizens you know in regards to voting is i think that would we've talked about this to a degree on, on the, in our last episodes it's like that would do a lot to you know uh i think to be, to beat back voter apathy and you know apathy in general from my sit from citizens and you know is you know to that degree the you look at the numbers this year really the electorate has been in, enacted in a way you know activated i should say in a way that we've rarely seen before we look at the numbers of votes there's been record uh, numbers of votes that have been that were tallied this year in regards to you know both sides you know look even as a loser, you know, uh, Trump had a record number of votes. You know, of course, Biden and Harris had a record number of votes as as the winners of the uh, of the overall electorate and as you know uh, in the in the electoral college. So it's that's a positive thing I think to, that we get to see man, as, as if, that more people are into it, and you know, hopefully that's something that could uh, that will keep on going. But do you want to say yeah. something? Yeah, but I, I would say just to kind of piggyback off your statement, Kyle, talking about how many people actually was went, was able to get out there and vote. Voting became a lot easier for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, right. ob yeah obviously you had the you had the viruses out there, and the numbers are spiking, are spiking even more now. So everybody wear a mask, be smart, you know, saying make sure you clean your hands and everything like that, and pass on a message to the next person. But if you give Americans the tools and the knowledge about voting, uh. Gabe was out there doing, you know what I'm saying, doing the work uh, out there in the field. You're going to get more people that want to actually uh, participate. You have Lindsey Lindsey Graham that was on Fox News, I believe it was Lindsey Graham, saying like, hey, we got to figure out what's going on with this mail-in voting because they keep doing this. Republicans won't ever win again. Mm -hmm. As I said last time, one plus one equal two, y'all. So they're trying to take the vote away. They're trying to suppress it, suppress it because they don't want people to vote. I mean, Joe and Biden's going to end up with yeah, I'm yeah, actually ahead. glad you brought that up because there were so many people I know at the polls who had a big, like, apprehensive viewpoint or fear about vote by mail ballots and whether or not their vote would count. And I would continuously explain to them as long as your ballot is postmarked by election day, it will count. Like, we had drop off yeah. boxes at our polling site, and they were at the other 49 polling sites across the city. And I knew my poll investigator very well. I got to know with her and I literally would watch this lady every night, pack those vote by mail ballots up in a blue suitcase, stuff them into her car and drive them directly to 39th Street downtown for those ballots to be casted. But it was like, no matter how much you tried to tell people, a lot of people were very apprehensive and, and fearful of taking that route. And I saw about like 350 voters a day coming through. The number of first time voters was unbelievable. And I was glad to see that. And I think another thing I was glad to see is that they actually had early voting sites across the city opened up, opened up as super sites where you could still register to vote on election day. I never ever have seen anything like that in my life. And I think that's something that needs to continue. Um, yeah, yeah. Moving forward. It, interestingly enough, you know, given, you know, Gabe, and we gonna we gonna talk a little bit of ball later, you know, just on some on some regular stuff. But you know, the, the big site was the United Center here in town. Yeah. And you know, I, I you know, I guess that did a lot for people as well, being able to vote at such a notable area that we you know, we don't associate with uh the po the political process, but you know, I and this and this goes back too to when when uh you know they had the stoppage in the nba and part of their demands were to have uh the local arenas you know and not all of them did it but a lot of them did the local arenas in each nba city be a part of uh be voting centers and stuff like that this is this is why that stuff was inventive thinking and really was was nice to see that the players used that as part of their process and applying pressure uh to the owners and stuff because it, I think it did make an impact. It, it did here. I, 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 we've had 
probably have to look at other areas, news reports and stuff to see. But I think in Atlanta, there was a big impact too as well. There was a lot of work taken at the arena down there. And I think in Miami as well, so a couple of places I've heard. So, you know, it, it, it's just interesting. The whole, we, we it, it's sort of like the sports in general. There was a lot of, there's been a lot of experimenting this year with scheduling and stuff like that. And some of these teams in the NBA and the MLB and stuff, they're, they're finding new ways to do things. And it's like, you know, maybe maybe this is something that can catch on in the future. And, you know, we sort of got that a bit with our electoral process too now. And I think more more than ever you're getting that that uh that voice coming out about changing the electoral college and you know the like I say just the way that we do things a couple weeks ago on the show, I advocated for a voting season, not just a voting day, uh, an established voting season. That you know it could be a month or six weeks or something, and I think that's that's the type of thinking that we need to get that we need to get in more engaged with, and get away from the stuff that the Republicans are talking about. The Republicans are trying, of course, you know, they trying to cut off all voting the one day. <laughs> you know, if if it if it ain't if it wasn't counted on Tuesday, that Tuesday, then you, we ain't gonna count it. But that's not gonna be the case because. We we just we 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 have to we have to count every vote, and that's been the main you know that's been the main uh, uh, source of, of division in this past week. You know you got you know you ha- you got people for Trump split. You have people for Trump split in two different areas. In one area they say don't count the votes in Detroit, and in in Arizona they say count the votes. Like you know it's, it's the type of madness that we've been going through this past week. I was actually going to oh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Oh, I was going to I was going to yeah. bring up. No, oh, well, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Dave. I was going to say it's hopeful. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. No, the only thing I was going to say is I hope the same verb for for voting. You know, pulls up. You know, sh- yeah, I was going to say that I hope that same enthusiasm for for voting in Chicago continues. You know, mm-hmm. the, the elections for politicians, especially for Alderman, mm-hmm. um, and things like that, it continues. I think that, for, you know, previously, a lot of politicians, especially Alderman, you know, stay in for a long term because the mm-hmm. largest, you know, people that uh, tend to vote tend to be older people. And they tend to vo- vote the same people in, even if they're good or not, um, whether yeah. they're forming based upon previous relationships or experiences with said person. So I hope that same you know, momentum and also as far as, as well as creativity, as far as making voting easy for people continues, you know, subsequent elections, even when it's just on a local level, not just on a national uh, level. Yeah, we, we spoke yeah. about that before too, about totally agree. engaging citizen citizens in the process of, of electing uh, officials and having that be more of a basic part of our education and not just being something that we, that we stumble into every two or four years. And, and and you can look at, you know, from the stories that we've already heard from Gabe, like the difference that that could make, you know, him being an 11 year old being introduced to certain things uh-huh. and how that's helped him as a young man now, you know, have the, the inclination, the, the urgency to want to be involved in the process as well and educate, re-educate himself and, you know, possibly educate others. That's that's meaningful. We need more people to feel the way that gave is feel. And typically, and typically, once you start voting at a very young age, you continue you continue to vote throughout your life. So if you start voting, like my first time I voted, I was was I nineteen? I didn't get a chance to vote in. I'm gonna show my age right here. Uh, I didn't get a chance to vote in uh, Gore versus Bush. I was in DeKalb at NIU. I didn't know anything talking about uh, Gabe talking about um, understanding your rights or the knowledge of voting. I didn't understand what an absentee ballot was. I had never heard anything like that. I always saw my family. I mean, not too many of them went away to college. So if we needed to go to vote, we just went around the corner and went to the school. So I had no idea what an absentee ballot was. So I missed on that one. And my grandmother ripped me a new one because if you live in a house, you got to vote. Um, <laughs> Kyle's auntie, you know, that like now. That. 
Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. You know, saying she got on us. So I made sure the next time I voted, I would I came back home and I voted. So I think I might have been 19, either 19 or 20 next time I voted. But typically, once you, as you said, if you're raised like that, you're raised in a household, you see people vote, uh, your elders in the household, they vote, you typically start voting. And if you start voting at a young age, you always typically just keep on voting. Is it going to be some some elections you might miss out on or some might you might want to take a stand and say, I don't want to vote or whatever the case may be? Yeah, that's probably going to happen. Everybody has a life. You can't do everything, right? Uh, but you're typically going to go out there and vote. So, but I did want to bring this up. We talked about how um, the amount of people that came out and voted, right? Uh, going back to my point, talking about keep on voting. So in 2016, for the presidential election, it was... 128 million people voted, right? 128 million for this for this election. They're thinking this. They're thinking it was, uh, that's, uh, yeah, 159 million. So 128 to 159, and it goes back to the point of making voting more accessible. Yeah. You can vote. You can vote by mail. You can do early voting. Uh, you can have it where, like Cal said, kind of like a season. Okay, yeah, because of the pandemic, we don't know if we're going to do anything. Kind of post it for a longer period of time. But hey, if you, you know, saying as long as you get your your ballot in by X date, it's going to count. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of building upon more uh, ways to vote. And if you give people more avenues to vote, you'll be able to do it. Listen, we vote in the middle of, no I mean, the beginning of November. It's cold as hell throughout the majority of the country. And it's on a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. not like, it's not like oh we it ain't it's like it's not like we voting on August thirty first or hell September thirty first or July thirty first when people are or out, the out, out or the week or the weekend. So it's not like that. It's at a very obscure point of time throughout the calendar year, which is just so odd. But if you give people the chance to vote, you make it like Cal said a voting season. It's going to happen. And now Cal, now people they didn't had a taste of this. Man, you give somebody some filet me young and then turn around and give them some tofu. They don't want that damn tofu. They want that filet me young. So if you now giving people the chance to go out and vote in these multiple ways, you know already that 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 that, that horse that left the barn now. What you gonna do when they say, Oh no, y'all can only vote on one day? Oh, Hell no, no, uh -uh. no, no, no. I want to vote like I do the last time. So right. and, and it's up to the American people. So now it's up to elected officials to say, hey. Uh, or at least the ones that maybe agree with the people that feel this way. Hey, we got to make sure that we give our constituents these many multiple avenues to be able to voice their opinion or voice their, or voice their vote or cast their vote because we just saw right here 160 million people just voted. This is the most people I think voted since FDR 1932. And I don't even know how, yeah, how many people even lived in America then. Like 200 some million people, you know, said 250 maybe, yeah. and we were like 350. So that's crazy. So it's all about giving people. It's all about giving people the the avenues to vote. And once you give people the knowledge and the avenues to vote, they are definitely go out there and vote. Gary, what what have been your uh, what have been your thoughts on all uh, this post election day madness? You know, being someone who was in 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 a who, Acted as an election official and has known you're, you're intimate now with the process. You know how things have gone on. Like you said, you've seen your the people come out of your office and go with they collected the mail votes and all that stuff. They you know what's you know what's going on. Like to see the way that the Republicans and well Trump's people in particular, yeah. you know, some Republicans have had his back definitely, but to see the way that they've really gone after the system and really just made it, you know, of course, as, as they've done a lot of things, just make a clown show out of it. You know, what, what has been your reaction to all that? I think it's unfortunate, but it's something that I expect from a guy of his caliber. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you see black people showing up to the polls in record numbers, like you talk about how 159 million people in this country, like, I want to know how many black people alone showed up to the polls because like I was amazed by how many people I saw on my first day of early voting alone. And I could tell that people were fed up. I could tell that people were tired and 
Like I and said, for those who don't know, you were in a you were in a, a completely black area. For those yeah, don't know. yeah, in, in the heart of it, and it just was amazing to see all of us just showing up and showing out. Like no matter if it was an eighteen year old that was a first time voter, twenty four year old. I met a woman that was fifty two years old, and it was her first time voting. Wow! And you know she wasn't familiar with anything, and I helped her vote. I seen I I, I helped a lady who needed assistance and could not read or write. It was around in her early sixties, and that was a touching experience. You know that this woman thought enough of voting to come in. And let us know from the moment she hit the door, like, hey, I want to vote and I need someone to assist me. And can you do it? Um, I thought that was profound. It could not read or write. Yeah, I think in her early 60s. Oh, somebody echoing. Touching yeah. experience. You know that this woman thought enough. <laughs> Who got that feedback? To come in and let us know. Oh, that's know. you. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, I want to vote and I need someone to assist me. And can you do it? Um, I thought that was profound. Said, it it, it just, just mute your, uh, your laptop. Oh, oh, I yeah. 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 You know that this woman <laughs> Oh, wow. What's that? Okay. All right. All right. Now, Gabe, yeah. Now, Gabe, Gabe, go ahead and talk. Now, go. Go ahead. I'll, I'll mute yourself. I'll mute yourself, Gabe. Yeah. Oh, there you yeah, go. So like, when, yeah. I, when I really think about the Trump administration and what they were trying to I just think that that's very unfortunate because, in my opinion, this process is here to stay and it should be here to stay. And to seek, you know, out various tactical devices and utilizing social media as a way to like promote misinformation in a world where we already have an overload of information and a lot of people don't necessarily know how to discern between various uh, reports. I, I, I don't like it one bit. And I think that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to be involved in this election, because it's like social media has played a big part of my life as a millennial. And to see how he's utilized social media, it, initially it was to his advantage to get in the, in the office, but to like disengage voters and, and people from one to become registered voters. It's just it's baffling to me and it's crazy because it's like social media has played a big part of my life as a millennial and there you go uh no i no dave i think that's 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 a key point too and also too man um you gotta look at it like i mean he's a con artist right i think we dave kyle we've talked about this before he's a con artist man that's what he's doing right now he conned his way to get in and he's trying to con his way to stay in office right yeah but obviously it's just not working right now we see how many people, uh, you know, how many elected officials across the country on both sides of the aisles are coming out saying like, no, nah. you know, saying this is there was no shenanigans going on. There, this is the election. Uh, everything was up to par. That's why, you know, saying it's great to have you on. Cal, happy you on because you was actually there. And you told the story how the lady kind of put everything in a blue suitcase and took it over to the precinct and go ahead and get counted. So I think more people need to uh, hear stories like this of somebody inside who was in the mix and actually seeing what's going on because hearing hearing from people like you gave it can cut through that mis that misinformation that unfortunately a lot of people I think are getting. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. I want to bring up, you know, because this is essentially what's gonna to come to our lawsuits. And um, you know, a lot of the uh, most pretty much they're all being knocked down, you know, uh Trump and his people bringing up lawsuits in different states about, you know, trying to, they're trying to dredge up any sort of, in, in you know, any sort of uh, evidence that they can for voter and, in, in, you know, in, uh, uh, in, in equities and stuff like that, you know, no fraud, basically. Mm -hmm. And they can't find anything, of course, because they don't have any, you know, they, they don't have any, uh, you no, know, they, they don't know what they're doing, essentially. And it, it, it makes you think about how lucky we kind of are that for as, as evil and as 
uh, backwards thinking and, you know, negative, just negative that these people are, they're just as inept as they are anything else. So if they, if, if you know, if they were actually functioning, you know, we, we would have been in a lot more trouble these past four years if they actually functioned right as uh, in, in doing what they wanted to do. But, I agree with you. Yeah. But uh, this take, it's, it also makes you think of the fact that even before as a so, president, Go ahead, Dad. You want to come in? No, I just had a question. I mean, so you mean as far as so you said is what the Republicans are Trump being inept and trying to suppress the uh, votes votes being counted? Yeah, they they were inept in trying to suppress the votes because. You know, we, we've gotten record votes, so they were definitely inept in doing that. But they're also they're being just as inept also in uncovering fraud. They put out this art that their whole argument at this point is based on there being some sort of voter fraud. That's what's that's the only thing that's going to allow them to hold on to their positions of power. And they can't find they can't uncover anything because they don't know what they're doing. They just they're essentially lying. And there's and they're trying. They can't even back up their lie because they're enough that you know back that line and backing up their lie. And Cal, I want to add something to what you're saying right now too, because I think it's very important. How you talking about how inept they uh, inept they are, right? This they they're just dumb with this, right? It's also just dumb politically. Yeah, on so many levels, yeah. right? So think about it like this. I'm on TV. I'm Trump, right? Hello, whatever. I'm on TV. <laughs> I'm on TV and I'm telling you how bad it is to vote by mail. How yeah. they're going to steal the mail. How they're going to steal the vote. I'm telling it because really he's only talking to his base because he doesn't care about the rest of the country, right? I'm telling you how bad it is. But now you're complaining about the mail in votes. You damn idiot. You told your people not to vote by mail. So you can't be shocked when I can't believe 100,000 or 250,000 votes came out of Philadelphia by mail. If you wouldn't have told your damn people not to vote by mail, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad because yeah. you have you have your group, what you're telling them not to do. And obviously the other group is looking at them like, nah, I'm going to do the opposite. Let me send in my vote by mail. And boom, you have the explosion. Of uh, on 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 voter night, it was kind of like yeah, it's behind. It was like wait a minute, hold on. And I was saying this too, like wait a minute, hold on. You said all these votes that came in by mail that still had to be counted. So you have to look at it too, just bad politically. And also yeah. too, I don't want to ever, I don't know, I don't want to ever shit on anyone who is not in the political arena that wants to get into the political arena. I think everybody is American. This goes to Donald Trump too, although I think he's an ass. Everybody that's American should be able to run for any office they want to. God bless you. That's within our Constitution. Go for it, right? But you have to be sure of the people that are not in a political realm that try to jump into the political realm. This yeah. man was not a part of it. All he did was try to pay off politicians to get his either stay out of jail or get buildings built with his name on it, right? He didn't understand the, he didn't know how the government functions. He didn't understand the political game. The game of politics is, is to, is the game of politics is, uh, is to add, not subtract. Everything he did was the complete, it was, he was bizarro guy. He was bizarro president. Everything he did was the complete opposite of it. So I think people have to be a little, hopefully people look at people, Look at candidates who might not be in a political realm. I hope they look at them in a, with a with a with a closer eye because you don't want to have anyone come into office that doesn't know how government works or how politics works because this is what you're going to get. And and we like I said before, he's a con man. All he's doing is running a con, and he's trying to get money out of his supporters to kind of keep this ruse going that he won the election. Yeah, and you, and you have to look at the history of the man and the way that he has engaged in just about any industry that he's been involved his in for his whole life. And that's what I was going to get into right quick. Like th the fact that his presidency is going to end with him failing in, in the judicial system with lawsuits, with unfounded lawsuits is maybe the most accurate uh, an appropriate thing to apply to Donald Trump because exactly he, he may be the most litigious person in yep. the history of the United States of America. 
And I want to bring up this uh, this post I saw. I, I saw another post that I couldn't get into because of a uh, you know paywall, unfortunately. That said, the five most outrageous Donald Trump lawsuits. But I found another uh, post from the Reeves Law Group that has the top fifteen lawsuits involving Donald Trump. Oh, and wow. I'm looking at more. more. Yeah, ten more. Yeah, they 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 tripled down on it. He sued. He sued New York uh, among the these. Uh, I put I put actually the link up in a second. But among the uh, lawsuits listed here, he sued New York Times reporter Timothy O'Brien, uh, L. O'Brien, uh, for having the nerve of accusing the Donald of holding a more meager net worth than he liked reporting. Uh, he sued his ex-wife, of course, Ivanka Trump. You know, uh, people who remember when they were married, you know, they had a lot of crazy stuff go yeah. on. He sued Merv Griffin, who, uh, interestingly enough, we're going to talk about Jeopardy in a little bit. Merv Griffin you know, uh, created the show Jeopardy. But the Donald sued him uh, apparently over something with uh, one of his casinos in Atlantic City. And, um, yeah, it's... <laughs> He sued. He sued other Trumps, of course. Yeah, he family. sued his brother. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he sued. He, uh, New York sued Trump University. His fit is a uh, fraudulent. Talk about fraud. His fraudulent university. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he is. It's just crazy the the way that he he this this is really the main way that he settles all his beefs in life. It's through <laughs> through the courts and through. The bad lawsuits, and he loses all the time. Yeah, he loses all the time. That's why he I understand why people can't see what's going on. Like <laughs> this is what he does. He does yeah. it every time. I'm going to sue you, and then he go to court, and he be like, "Get the hell out of here," <laughs> and he just moves <laughs> on. But now it's kind of like he's at the. I mean, he was at the the ultimate summit of the political world, and I mean, just in the world in general, being the. Uh, President of the United States, he loses and he goes right back into his old ways. I'm just going to sue. Come on, man. We've seen this game. But everybody hasn't seen this game. 70 million people who voted for him haven't seen this game. And he's just conning them alone. Well, they've ignored it. You know, right. it, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. I, usually I, when we've seen, the, when we seen them I see think, people like Bill Maher, we could just ignore it and turn, turn the page in the uh, in the in the tabloid, you know, but now we all have to go through it because we elected the president for a while. But anyway, go ahead, Dave. No, what I was going to say is I think that we kind of spoke to that point last week through the text commission where the reason why a lot of his voters are enamored with him is the, the allure of Trump or the allure of him being a successful businessman. Yep. And, you know, through vicariously, they think by voting for him, they become a part of his brand. It's like buying it's like buying Jordan. By buying Jordan, you are a part of the Jordan brand. Yeah. So by buying the Trump, you are a part of his brand or the illusion of what his brand represents. And I think that's what retracts a lot of people to him is that the Trump brand in their mind means, I don't want to use the word necessarily regal, but something that's, you know, high-end or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. a lot of people and a lot of people... For it's whatever not reason, gold plating on everything. Yeah. yeah. I see him as, the, you know, the, the station of success. Yeah. And, 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 and right, exactly. It's gold, every, his, word, his name is gold plated. His name means the top of everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah. unfortunately, I think that was one of the allures that some people in the hip-hop community... Yeah. Uh, well, rap, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call, yeah. want to say them. That's why they. That's why. I mean, I can. I remember listening to a lot of hip hop records back in the day that they talked about Trump. They want to be rich by Trump. I remember, oh, oh yeah. Ice Ice Cube. When I think when um yeah. not not with currently Ice Cube, but when Trump um was first elected, I I saw an interview with him. And he was saying, like, yeah, you know, saying people like Trump because you could he could say what you want to say. He rich, he could do this, he could do that. That's why people yeah. like him. And that's and that and that is so true. It, and he was able to bring out some people, even more people than he did before, because it's kind of like I want to be uh, to Dave's point, I want to be hooked up to this brand because I want to be like that. I want to I want to emulate that. Unfortunately, well, now he'll say unfortunately, fortunately. 
five or six million or more people is like, get the fuck out of here. But um, but but today's point, I think people really want to be hooked to something. It's like they still like we don't have kings and queens in this country. We don't have re- we don't have those kind of titles, but we have celebrities. And what's one thing that people really thrive off of? Off of are celebrities, and they want to be attached mm-hmm. to something. They maybe don't have that fulfillment in their life. Not saying that they are, you know, saying lost souls, but they don't have that fulfillment, and they see him come along, and it's kind of like. I feel good, you know what I'm saying? He makes me feel this way. I want to get attached to that. And it and it works. And 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 it works. But Trump and not really, just the thing, they want to be attached to that wealth. You know, yeah, because exactly. Trump yeah. represents wealth. Like, That's yeah. Right. Yeah. like I like I, I I watched Trump the Un American Dream on Netflix and mm-hmm. how they were showing his interviews, you know, on lifestyle of the rich and famous with Robin Leach and so forth, like that. I remember being a kid and looking at a lot of rap videos from the early 2000s you had nelly saying like let me in now like bill gates donald trump everybody yeah. wanted to be a billionaire and when or a millionaire and when you saw these guys that went Forbes magazine he was one of the first people you saw if it wasn't yeah. bill gates it was donald trump and yeah. I, I think just the fact that he had this extravagant chain of amenities under his like business portfolio made him an attractive person to various communities across the American landscape. Yeah. Whether in rural America or whether in inner city America. Yeah, I want I, w- I was gonna bring that up that yeah, that's a great way of saying it. Like though these ideas we could we could pinpoint them on certain areas like rappers or poor white folks or you know racists <laughs> but a lot their state there when you look at things there are certain threads of thinking and you know shared aspirations that tie all of us together that tie Absolutely. many of our communities together and it's not you know money. for the thing that separate us yeah money aspirations wealth fame mm-hmm. all these things are things that you tap into these things with the american uh with the american community and you can go a long way it's not i think the most powerful person in the country, he and, and really we saw this over the past four years. He got that way by tying in our obsession with celebrity with a populist political view that right. made that made those 70 million people who voted for him in this election and whatever number who supported him throughout the last four years, he's made them into feeling they were part of a movement that was really gonna take down the all the the bad people in washington already already established in washington you're going to drain the swamp right you're going to you're going to you're going to reform and and do things that are going to allow for a better uh better america of a, a, a bringing back an america that uh that props up and and uh, and appreciates the rural person in america the farmers the white man though even though he, he wouldn't say that straight up but a pit, but most of his most of his uh, theories and his his agendas were basically uh, built to prop up white men, and and that was that was the that was the case that was the case that was something that a lot of people had to be woken up to, mm-hmm. and a lot of people still haven't been woken up to, unfortunately. But over the course of these four years, we had to so many people had to learn that. He's really not going to do anything good for you. So you have to pull a, pull yourself away from this thinking, or you're going to be in for a lot of bad stuff going forward. You're already in for a lot of bad stuff this year. We see how many people have died needlessly. We see how many people have lost wealth and lost whatever little money they've had. You know, we have to get off this train before we completely derail ourselves as a society and as a nation. And thankfully, enough people saw that. Yeah, and, it, and think about it, like you said, kind of like uh, disconnect themselves from it. Of, of hopefully, but well, thankfully enough, people did. You look at Trump; he utilizes social media to get into the get into the uh, into the political arena, uh, throwing out the birth of the birth of uh, racist mm-hmm. as theory, whatever like that. But he utilizes social media, and what's the one thing that kind of yeah. which basically like a conspiracy dopamine, theory. basically conspiracy theory. Thank you, thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, what's the one thing social media uh, kind of does right now to people's brain? It's kind of like a dopamine. It's kind of like getting, it's got getting high. You know what I'm saying? You got to be able to 
disconnect yourself from that. I, I heard a, mm -hmm. um, a story about a, a guy, an older white gentleman who was um, who was I mean, he was pro Trump. I mean, 10 toes down, man. Like you couldn't tell him anything. I believe something happened within the pandemic. He wasn't I, I, I feel bad because I can't tell a story like 100 percent, you know, um, with, a, with a good flow. But basically he got it. He got disconnected from social media. And once he got disconnected from social media, it was kind of like he his eyes were open to reality. And it was like, wait a minute, hold on. Like none of what he was saying on Twitter or Facebook or whatever was nowhere true. Like this is I like I have seen the light kind of a thing. And I think that's what is kind of happening right now. He still have these people under the spell using social media because that's as you see, he just came out of the bunker today to pay his respects, thankfully, because of, for Veterans Day, shout out to all the vets out there. But he, he showed up to that late too. <laughs> yeah. He didn't want to he, he has checked out. Disrespect, man. Yeah. He, he, he would have did out. that. He would have did that at any point of his presidency, though. Because no, no, he would no. be just that's his natural inclination to disrespect. I, I, I get I get that. No, no, no doubt. But what I'm trying to say is we haven't Good. seen him. We haven't seen him. This is the first time we've yeah, like right, right. seen him. So it's yeah. kind of like you know you got to you got to uh, got to see until these people kind of get disconnected. I'm sure the people on the other side say that we're 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 we need to be disconnected. Whatever the case may be. Yes, we're in the echo chamber sometimes. We all are, right? But it's just kind of it's 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 amazing to see someone who who literally it's kind of like yeah, let me kind of like separate myself. And then after that separation it's kind of like damn like whoa this dude is on something else you know what i'm saying and it finally hits him so i mean trump is kind of like he is the the antithesis of everything what's happening right now in america culture and he was able to utilize it and get to the highest point but that same thing that he did is also his downfall the perfect the perfect story if you want to say Poetic, you know, justice. poetic justice, poetic justice, yeah. And and I think I, I think it's uh to jump on your point when you say about the social media, I think this this was a good the perfect time for him to make that uh that climactic attempt at politics because people forget he's made pre prior runs for president. I think yep. 2000 in particular was one when where he really was in there trying. Like and, and he was actually running as like sort of a moderate Democrat I think, at that time, mm -hmm. which is yeah. funny, which is hilarious as well. And people don't remember that. But but you no, know, Trump is like I said, he's had his previous flirtations with office, with uh, with running for the highest office. And you know, I think the difference about today's time and social media and that that dopamine effect, like you say, D, him him and people like him, and even you know, people from Russia or whatever who may have been assisting them, they were able to tap into uh, certain areas of, the, of of our voting demographic, you know, directly with social media. Yeah. They were able to give them that dopamine directly mm -hmm. as opposed to previous eras. The, you know, everything that he said would have had some sort of, there'd have been some sort of way to block it from, you know, some way to block it and uh you know sort of you know go through it like the way that the the it took him a while but the news uh channels eventually stopped just reporting him and, and showing his rallies and stuff and ended up fact checking him yeah. like in a previous era you would have had all the newspapers all the tv outlets doing that they would have been they would have had time to do that they wouldn't have had this other area of media that would have went directly to voters and would have been able to go direct into their veins, you know, metaphorically and just and rile them up and, and give them that that feeling that they got from his campaigning. You know, you, he wouldn't have been able to do that as directly. He would have been more like, I think, a Ross Perot figure who could have been a disruptor. And, you know, Perot did a lot to disrupt the 92 election. Yeah. But in the end, he was he was discounted because for all his rantings and ravings, we, he was able to be disregarded because, you know, people were able to see him for what he was before voters got too enamored with him. And I think Fox, Fox News has a part to play in it as well because they were yeah. one of the biggest allies. You think about everything yeah. that they and, have and I, I mean, Yes, 
under Roger L. And they turned they they wound up turning on them in the end too. It's, yeah, it's like the last couple of weeks they've turned on them too. Yeah, yeah. turned on them. They, they, you they, 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 they've 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 turned they've turned on him. Who hasn't turned on him is OAN. I don't know what that net, the, the issues are. The OAN network. Yeah, one American. That's, one that's American really network, his yeah. station. Um, and then also another one American network, right? Yeah. One American Network is his station now. Um, you know that's so. Yeah, there's him and, him and like, there's a couple of places election. for him to kind of right. But there's also one. Yeah, and it, but there's also one American Network, and on a social media tip, there's a site called Parlor. So when all of them get kicked off mm-hmm. of Facebook and Twitter, they end up going to Parlor. Yeah. So Parlor is kind of a platform of conservative views like that. And yeah, I've heard you know, they I think they have like a usership of like four million people within like two years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Their ability to influence yeah. will not be so, you know, I think that's kind of the point where I think about yeah. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna have a voice and they're gonna continue to, you know. Yeah, especially not now because I think that so especially they're gonna have a voice as long as people in this country feel disenchanted and this, you know, and Unempowered, and they use social media as an escape mechanism. And to like Dee's point earlier about the story with the old white guys, that ultimately a lot of people who tend to, you know, absorb his story, especially the people on the lower end socioeconomically, are the people who spend a lot of time on social media. So, I mean, and mm-hmm. you know, in the social media space, you got one, you either one or two people, you either a content creator or either you're a consumer. And you know, I can put out anything, you know, in a lot of cases, and you know, and it not be fact checked. I think what Trump has been kind of the master of, and uh, really being able to spread disinformation, and he's been able to spread it effectively to the older generation who are the least likely to fact check. I think we kind of mentioned that before. Um, uh, As my family have has a chat group, um, my brothers and my father. And somebody, and one of them had posted like a meme of George, so uh, someone essentially mimicking the Trump at Saint George Soros, and they had a guy wearing an aluminum foil hat to protect his head from the brain waves, the radioactive brain waves. That I guess were coming in from the TV. It's just you know, there's a lot of misinformation that tends to go through you know consistent channels, and it has to be, um, you know, like the George Soros, and of course, uh, uh Biden. Hunt- Buying, there's just like these kinds of they choose focused on and say these people are the ones who are you know usurping American democracy and they end up and you know through misinformation campaigns and a lot of we're educated people will just eat that stuff right on up I you know especially yeah. just going through social media's um, ability to push out disinformation and Facebook places like Facebook haven't been aggressive enough. Why well, they've been aggressive with speech then but they haven't been aggressive enough to like call, you know, disinformation. Yeah. And that's why yeah. you see how America is like literally you will have some portions of the country that would just be what they are. You know, saying you're gonna have, you know, Idaho, Utah, South Dakota, North Dakota, Mississippi, Louis. I mean we we have we have self segregated ourselves on top of what the government did before they you know saying you know what I'm saying they kicked it off but we have self segregated uh definitely still towards races also about political where our political leanings are going you know so um yeah it's a lot it's a lot to it right. i mean you have a lot of different information man and that and that just basically does like this i don't know where that's going to lead um i always bring up the fact that and I've been tweeting about this. I've been tweeting this a lot today. It's like we got it. Like everybody's always asking the Democratic Party or whoever it may be, liberals who want to say, like, man, you know, what I'm saying how how once before Barack Obama was able to, was able to carry Iowa two times in a row, but now Iowa has swung so far over. It's like, yeah, that's true, and it's probably some explanation to that. But I always try to ask the question: Why is the Republican Party okay with losing a popular vote seven out of eight times? In the past eight elections, why are you okay with that? 
I mean, I know you want to ask a queer. It always seems to go back to liberals, man. Why, you know what I'm saying? These white folks, man, they just ain't voting for y'all no more. It's like, yeah, okay, that's that's true. But at the same time, why did your guy who basically ran a white supremacy, yes, he was able to get 10 million more votes, but he still lost by 5 million. It's like a basketball game and somebody saying like, man, y'all did a good job. You know what I'm saying? Y'all made it closer than what it was. Your ass still lost. It all, right. it all it comes down to if you win or you lose, you still lost. So why I think the Republican Party also has to figure out like, okay, we've lost since 1992 mm-hmm. to one to, to 2020. It's been one time you all won a popular vote, and that's because George Bush had just kicked off the uh, Iraqi War and, and knocked out Saddam Hussein. That one time, you have to look at that too. It's not just so much of oh, the Democrats are losing white white voters. They've been losing white voters since. LBJ. It's the other question too. Like, okay, it's always it's two pieces to this puzzle. Now it's not just one piece; it's more pieces. Like, why? Why is that? Okay, so it's a lot of different questions that the American people, because we're the ones who run it. I do firmly believe that it's a lot of questions that we have to ask ourselves. Like, okay, why is this happening as well? Go ahead, Dave. No, I was going to say is that using the term, I think using the term liberal, liberal with the Democratic Party is a bit of a misnomer because, I mean, Democratic Party has people that swing, you know, on wide spectrum. And like a lot of, yeah. to, to my point, with like disinformation that a lot of that was promoted against Joe Biden and Kamala with the, with the expectation that they were going to be puppets for the radical. I mean, it's, right. you know, really right. erroneous. And I mean, the reality of it is, well, I think a lot of Republican voters don't get, especially when it comes to African-American voters and why we vote Democratic, it's not because it's not necessarily always in our best interest. But if I have a choice between a cancerous tumor and one that's benign, I'm going to take the one that's benign. And I think, yeah. you know, I think that's unfortunately, you know, while that advantage is not at least put me back. I think it's what, you know, and I, so I just, when we're using the term, you know, liberal and, you know, and sometimes Democratic parties, we have a large range of people, you know, yeah, we the, do. Yeah. you know, as far as under the, the umbrella or views, yeah. you know, we have centrist views, which, yeah, like, which in reality, people like Obama and then Biden and Harris are centrist Democrats, you know, left, of course, is the LC, the Il- Ilham Omar. Um, and Bernie, that's that's the you know the quote unquote radical left, yeah, um, which is another conversation, ironic but another conversation. But I just think we just need to be conscientious about nomenclature, you know, tagging. Yeah, yeah, the, I know, agree with that. Party. I agree with that. Yeah, there are a lot so, of uh, misnomers in regards to what you, you what you call a progressive or or a conservative or a liberal or you know mm-hmm. whatever, and, and the way that they're applied to the two major parties and. Like you say, Dave, having people like AOC and the squad and, uh, you know, Bernie in, you know, having them caucus with the Democrats is meaningful and it's going to likely lead to some sort of, you know, uh, issues that are going to have to be resolved within the party. Even It's already happened. Yeah, Yeah. we've been seeing the reports already. AOC has been particularly uh, vocal about ways that people like her are being supported within the party. And, uh, you know, that's something that they're going to have to deal with if they don't want to lead to a one-term presidency for Biden, you know, and and really just a, a waste of their momentum that they gain coming out of this. But uh, I think... But I think their issues was... I know uh, you had some moderate Democrats who were expected to win and did not win. Uh, you had something that just barely held on, and majority of the liberals of the, the far, I ain't gonna say far left, I hate saying that, the more the more liberal Democrats uh, they won. But I know I, I know they had a leaked, air quote, leaked audio come out of their, of their talks with un- amongst themselves, and they were saying how I like to defund the police um, uh, moniker or, uh, uh, or a phrase kind of really hurt some moderate. Uh, Democrats. The one thing I would oh, say to yeah, that, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the one thing I would say to that is you have to be able to explain to people what something me what something means. It's kind of like, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you might not be going through in Lily White, uh, Lily White uh, 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 suburb outside of Chicago where everything's cool, 
you know what I'm saying? You're not going through the same situation that somebody might be going through within this within the city in an urban area, right? But you have to be able to explain things. Now, I don't know if y'all ever saw, have y'all ever seen a YouTube? Uh, what's uh uh, the uncomfortable conversation with a black man, Acho. What's his, what's uh, Acho? Yeah, story? Emmanuel Acho. Emmanuel Acho, right? He had yeah. a um, he had a police department, a very small police department, I believe, out in California, where it's like the, the it's like one percent black people within the city, right? But he had them on because he's basically saying like, hey, we had we didn't know anything about really Kenosha, Wisconsin, and other smaller cities throughout the country, and you had. Uh, police violence that uh, it happened to a black person and all of a sudden everything blew up and he did ask him the question he said so what do you all think about defund the police and to all of them it was like you know when I first heard it I didn't understand it I didn't like it I thought they was basically talking about us like man we we out here protecting y'all and now you gonna turn around and say how you want to defund us but someone was able to explain to them what it meant and it was like yeah it doesn't bother me at all now it's like if you want to have Somebody else come and deal with half this crap that I have to deal deal with, you know what I'm saying? Or divert those funds to go somewhere else. I'm all for it. So everybody on the panel was like, "Yeah, I'm fine with it." So I think it's up to other Democrats within the party. Don't turn around and blame a phrase or a hashtag on why you lost. You need to under you need to be able to go to your constituents and say, "Hey, yeah, you know what? We're not dealing with this, but let me explain to you what's happening." This is why they feel that way. Let me break it down to you. You know, and it seems as if that didn't happen. So they want to turn around and put it back on AOC and uh, more more progressive Democrats. But I think it's more so and it kind of goes to the whole point of like, you got to be able to talk to people. You got to be able to get out there and kind of explain some things. You're their representative. If they don't understand something, they come to you, you have to be able to explain it to them. And that's one, another communication breakdown throughout the country among all of us. You got to be able to communicate with people, let people know what's actually happening out there. Or you're going to get, Cal, as you said, this infighting that's happening within the Democratic Party that's going to potentially make Joe Biden, which I don't think is going to happen, not going to would, but it's potentially making him to a one-term president. You got to be able to get out there and talk to people. I, I agree with a lot of what you say, D. I think, though, a part of it, I, I think a major part of it, though, is the fact that the Democrats all, they sort of always do have this this fractious environment that's involved with with their, you know, their agenda setting and stuff like that. Whereas the, the Republicans, even it, as we've seen the past four years, even when they have a dude in front of them that they don't really fuck with, they get they get in line. And they but use I that on a national but, level to get there, to get across and get done the things that they want to get done. And the Democrats I, I agree, I agree to do with that. that. I agree with that, but I do think you need a little, you need some contentions within your party. It's like Kyle, when we was doing, we was doing the show, whatever like that. It would sound boring as hell if we was all saying the same thing, agreeing on the same thing. We're all on sure. the same we all going down the same lane, but sometimes you got to nudge each other to kind of make it a little lively. I don't mind it being a contentious uh uh I sure yeah I don't mind that at all and I do I do think you need a a smart and coherent opposite party because that I I don't mind it I don't mind having the balance there because if you weigh one way if you weigh if you weigh heavily one way you see what you get you get Donald Trump in the in the current state of the Republican Party I think you need a little jostling. Uh, here and there within the party. Now, hopefully, it doesn't take you out, but I think it's healthy. I think it's healthy. But at the same yeah, time, they have, to, they have to direct themselves in a way. And I think I would have, you know, there's a there's a disagreement on which way they should direct themselves. Should it be more towards the middle? I'm more of the thinking that they should direct themselves more towards the the way that the AOCs and the squads and the people like that want to want to go into. But that that friction. It can't lead to nothing happening. They have to utilize that again as iron sharpens iron to create yeah. something better yeah. than what they have at the moment. I got okay, you. you want to say something? Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm I'm all for jostling and, and the need to you know have different variations of opinions within yeah, the, no, the party. Was, oh. However, my my issue with that is like when it comes to every four years for the presidential election, and then you're seeking to get House and Senate seats. If you're not all on the same page by then, it's not, e you know, it, it, it's, it's easy to see how things might have went left in 2016 because it was that same dissension then. 
Yeah. On like the same page this year, they put the best they had together, and it worked. Yeah, yeah. Dave, you got something? Yeah. No, no, I was gonna say no, yeah, no, I was gonna say you have to be from a public media standpoint, you have to at least, you know, be on the same front. Because it, especially when you when you're dealing with a party uh like the Republican Party. The Republican Party is the Detroit Pistons of politics, especially in this <laughs> last, you know, election. I see they you mean do, the bad you know, whatever man. they can do to win. I mean they're gonna do whatever they can do to win. I mean yeah, yeah, they're the bad boys of politics. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, they're gonna do whatever they can do to win. I mean, even with you know, with Trump dra- trying to drag out the elections uh, results in the courts, that's not necessarily him being inept. That's him trying to fight to, you know, that's him fighting to the end of the game. I think or no, trying to pro the game pull the game into overtime. Hey, I'm not. I mean, I'm not saying he's inept. Ultimately, doing that. I'm saying he's inept in the way they execute it. We we all know why they're doing what they're doing. The execution is enough. If they if they weren't enough, right. they would have been. They would have. Right. They would have at least. Well, they they would have at least presented something that looked like fraud. They they haven't even presented anything that looks like fraud. They haven't had any evidence. That's why they I'm down. Fraud. I'm down by forty five thousand. Well, but yeah. what about these ten babes and ballots right here? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, they didn't have any. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They they. If you're gonna they lie, they didn't have. But that, I think that's the point, though. That was the best thing that they had. So I, I, unless you can kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, anyway, I mean, so yeah, that's what they're gonna pull out. Whether it's, I mean, yeah, if, if it's the last thing you got, I mean, that's what you're gonna. That's what you're gonna go for. But the point yeah, that I was trying. But the point that I was trying to make is yeah. that when you're dealing with a party like the Republican Party, at least in a public meeting, should be on the front, United Front, which is possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's the and what happened seen. in 2016. We were, and we weren't. I mean, I think a lot of people were disenfranchised. Yeah, a lot of people were disenfr- were disappointed by Bernie not getting a nomination, and and they couldn't, but they couldn't uh, digest a Clinton presidency, and they voted for Trump yeah. even though it was against their best interests. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, this time around, hopefully, they learn a lesson a little bit. Yeah, and let's not forget they're talking. You, know, you have two parties that they, look. They at held two their different nose and virus, even if they didn't necessarily care for them because they knew the option was worse. Yeah, and let's not forget last point because uh, let's not forget the Republican Party is going to a completely different base than the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is a mixture of. I mean, it's like this bag of trail trail mix, right? The Republican Party is just a bag of toothpicks. They're all the same. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's 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 two different bases. You can have a very concise, <laughs> a very concise message because you're only going to one particular base. That's it. One particular people, unfortunately, because look at the Republican Party was a little bit diverse, at least in the, the you know early 1900s, all the way at least until the 1960s. Uh, it was a more diverse party, right? Conservatives, liberals, conservatives, uh, you know, it had everything, right? Now it's like I said, it's just, it's just this, just two, it's just it's the same damn thing, you know what I'm saying? This is it. Here, I mean, you got some walnuts, you got cranberries, you got some everything in there, and everything don't taste the same, <laughs> but damn it, we gotta make it work. <laughs> so that's the way, and that's the way that the Democratic Party is. You're gonna have these mm-hmm. issues because everything is not the same. That's 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 very artful. Uh, yes. you, like, you, you like my props. You like my props. I brought props. I brought props tonight. <laughs> right. I like I like that better than the melting pot. <laughs> <out> there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't no damn. Ain't no damn melting pot. Two picks and mix <laughs> and trail mix, baby. Two picks and trail mix, Dave. That's what I got. Let's let's lighten some things up here. Uh, uh, pale. I, I, think, I think that's immediately one of the, the t- my 10 favorite SNL skits of all time. I really do. Really? really? Let me wow. get this off. And I think I just, the randomness of it, for one, and the mm-hmm. the call, the, it was sort of a call back to Chappelle's show with him introducing it like he did. And it's just like, yeah, you you rarely get a skit on SNL where every second 
is funny. And there's no there's no downbeat to it. It's just yeah. You they keep layering, they keep everything added on to it. Like the way that they showed each character, first they just showed Aunt Jemima, but then they showed they then they revealed each character along the line. And Dave with that, st that stupid voice. <laughs> and then Pete Davidson just come out there with the full count chocolate mm -hmm. and and he does the breaking the fourth wall. Like it it does all these great things in it. And I, I just love I was uh, he didn't do much on the show, but no, he, he, did. Did, he did he did essentially a fourth of a of a special. He did like 15 minutes of stand-up. Mm -hmm. And, he, and the, he did that sketch. So that was enough for me. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm about to say his monologue was, man, that was something else. That might have been one of my best, one of my favorite monologues. I thought Bill mm -hmm. Bars uh, from a, like a couple of months ago or like last month, that was up there. Yeah, a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. Month, yeah, dude, that was that was a great that was a great uh, monologue. But man, Dave Chappelle, man, I mean, I don't know. I know a lot of people always say like he's the greatest of all time. I. Still Still might want to give it to Richard Pryor, man, because I just some of yeah. Richard Pryor old stuff, man. It's just unbelievable at that I particular time. Purely, I think Richard purely as a stand up, I give it to Richard. Yeah, but Dave as a stand up, he's close, but his ability to just put together something in a few minutes like that Uncle Ben thing and true just, uh, the, the Angel Mama, like the the, the sketch ability. And, and, that, and Richard had a great sketch show too for like he four. did he did you know NBC didn't let him keep it on uh -huh. so you you imagine like if he had a couple of years to refine his sketch show with what people still be talking about that but when you look at Chappelle's show and the just the like like the one and a half shows he's done for Saturday Night Live mm -hmm. it's like it's crazy just how effective he is in that format. Yeah, I just think I just think uh, Dave just kind of just he just hits you right where you need to be hit. You know what I'm saying? Because how many times Dave may hop in? Definitely. How many times have we seen something on the news and something that white folks are going through, which <laughs> unfortunately they're going through it, right? You don't wish it upon nobody. But you just sit back to yourself. It's like, damn, that sounds like black shit right there. <laughs> you know, so like some shit that we went through. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's what Dave was like. Come on, get your, you know. Yeah. I mean, you've you've I, we've we, we've experienced so much as a people in this country. And everybody else, not everybody else, particularly just basically just white people, uh, are starting to see or feel what we went through. It was it was a crack epidemic, crack the crack epidemic, but it's the opioid crisis. Damn, y'all got a crisis? Yeah, we just what the fuck, we the plague, goddamn it! You know what I'm saying? It's it's kind of like that. And what Dave is so great at is being able to be like, huh? Yeah, we went through that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't gonna be a pity party for you. We yeah. went through that too. And that's why, and I, that monologue is up there, man. And, I, and that's the one point I do love about Dave, man. That's that's that right there, man. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, Gabe, you want to jump in? I mean, anytime Chappelle on Saturday Night Live and any platform with a stand up, I'm always down to watch it. I've never mm -hmm. seen a, a comedian in my lifetime able to capture what's going on in any lens of America in the manner in which he has and know mm -hmm. how to do it in a way that. It cut at you deep, but at the same time make you laugh. It, mm -hmm. It's like damn, like really going through that and, and, and be able to rechronicle things that happened in events past and still be able to tie it back to present day. I mean, he's always gonna be up among the top uh, when it comes to stand up and exit comedians to me. Let me let me go let me go to the monologue right quick. Um, oh, nice. The rest of the country is trying to move forward, and these white niggas keep holding us back. <laughs> Let me leave it at that. As I said, man. As I said, I applaud David. If, if you want, you want to talk about goats too. Him and Pryor are probably the only black men they let say nigga on NBC. Oh right yeah. Too. Oh <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah, he, he's he's amazing, man. He, he's amazing, and and you look at you know just what he's done this year with the eight forty six special, and and he really just did Saturday Night Live really just to let people know that Chappelle show on Netflix again. That first couple minutes, that was a great bit too. We was talking about his great, his great grandfather. And he talked about yeah. this nigga being so more than <laughs> that, that, that was a hell of a way to drive. But he, he's he's great, man. It, it, you know, people want to give him the problematic label at times, and I guess you know sometimes he lives up to that. But I, I'm always gonna ride with him, man. He, he, you know, because he's he's the truest comedian there is right now, and. Whenever you could point the camera at him and give him something to say, he going to say something real and something that needs to be said, whether you like it or not. I, I totally agree. I totally agree, man. And, and, and one thing I just hope, I just hope uh, people, I don't think, I don't think Dave is definitely, he's not getting, he's not being taken for granted. I don't think so. But yeah. I, I just, yeah. I definitely think, I just, I, well, I hope, I hope that people are understanding what he's trying to say. Or what he's trying to get across. I mean, hearing somebody, yeah, you white niggas. I mean, that's that. That might it's probably just flip somebody right off hearing it. I'm um, hearing that it's going to happen, right? But I just hope that people are trying to people understand what he's getting at. My whole point of kind of like, yeah, this is how we were treated, and this is what we went through. It's your turn now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and is and you're not going to get that much sympathy because it was purposely done to us. So, I mean, I, I might I might have to watch that monologue again. Now you might after we done with this cuz I think I might have to watch that again. I was watching it with the I was watching it with the missus, and we were both like, it's crazy too. Like you still watch Dave, and he still makes your mouth drop open. Like I can't believe he just said that after all the stuff that we've seen him do uh, throughout the years. From R. Kelly P on you video to <laughs> to to uh the Chappelle skit to what we just saw last weekend, he still makes your mouth drop like, damn, I can't believe he just said that. Or mm -hmm. he makes you sit back and think. That's a sign of a genius, man. He he is a he's a genius. Yeah, yeah. And I I let's let's move quickly on to another guy who I think is if he's not a genius, he made a lot of people. You made money for some geniuses and some people who uh, made made you think you were a genius at certain points during the day, and that's Alex Trebek. Mm, yeah, you know we had to say goodbye to him. The latest big loss in 2020, but uh, you know it's interesting, man. You know I don't know. You know it seems like everybody has sort of a connection, particularly in our age, to Jeopardy in some way or another, some way that we relate to it or connect to it. So I don't know if y'all had anything that y'all wanted to speak about in regards to him. And it, it's interesting, like, he's going to last through, throughout the remainder of the year, uh, interest, interestingly enough, because they oh. shot episodes with him and they say they're going to air them up until, I think the last one's going to air, like, around Christmas or on Christmas or something like that. Wow. So he, he his spirit's still going to live with us for, for a little while. But... uh. But the show apparently is going to go on. There's no plans to end the show. I oh, think. So, yeah, 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 they're not going to do that. They, they shouldn't, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I think I sent you and Dave a link through a text about people who they were talking about uh, replacing him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know. First of all, I want to just talk about Trebek at, at large. And, if you know, if you had any thoughts about how the show would go on, you know, go ahead. Um... You know what, man? I just thought about this. You, bro, you saying um, that they're gonna have him kind of still doing it throughout the year? They shot up shows. We yeah. have the technology now that we can kind of keep them there. I mean, yeah, yeah. The hologram, yeah, yeah. Hologram. I mean, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, saying like a hologram of him standing right there. He could lit. I mean, what words have an Algebraic said? I mean, he's probably said yeah. every name you could think of. You have voice recognition when you, well, I could say it and it come out sounding like uh, Alex Trebek. You have the, you have, deep you have deep fakes. You know what I'm saying? Just go ahead and, you know what I'm saying? Utilize it to some good. Keep Alex Trebek around. You, you really don't have to get anybody. I mean, they can figure this out. I always say, my one thing, 
I always say, uh, when something technology, say some technical is, is happening, some type of advancement in, in, in technology, I always say, I always go back to it. You know, we went to the moon, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can find out how to put Al back on a TV, a TV screen and have him keep doing it, Jeopardy. <laughs> I mean, we went to the moon. We went to the moon. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, they don't really have to replace them. I, I guess they want an actual person there. But who who's going to say, like, man, no, nah, y'all can't have Al Shabek? Give me Al Shabek. You know? I, unless he, I, I unless he said his deathbed, unless he said his deathbed, like, y'all, y'all, you know what I'm saying? Don't do, don't do, don't do none of that weird he, shit. But he jokingly said a while back that he wanted Betty White to host. I, I yeah. think she a little bit too old for that at this point. No, nah, she's too old. Hey, I, I can't, I don't know, I don't know anybody. Maybe who's a dude who won the most? Jeopardy got enough money. He could probably my, pick, my pick would be Ken Jennings. Ken Jennings, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And and actually, they've incorporated him into the show this this yeah. season. Yeah, you you heard a game. Yeah, he's yeah. he's become a consultant and a producer on the show, and he's he's given the uh, you know he's giving answers up and stuff like you know on the show and stuff. So I think you know just coach him up a little bit, make him a little more. Of a host guy, and you know he he he's already like the guy you got to. He's like the final boss of Jeopardy, anyway. So it's like right. you, <laughs> should, <Final boss. laughs> you should be the host. Like he should like if if you can outdo me, I'll let you host. You know something like that. You know mm -hmm. he, he, he's the man. He owns Jeopardy, so he he kind of should host. In my opinion. I wouldn't be against that when he's damn near the face of it, you know, for how long he was able to last on it. Like, he had to watch it to keep when he was on. So that yeah. would be real good to see. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with that. I think there's a couple other people that I put up the link. New York Post put up a, a good uh, article about people who may be in the running. There's like a guy, because Trebek was big in the hockey there's like a guy who does announce it for the Kings who he recommended. Mm. And there's like a young sister who was uh, like, she's like a media, a, a, a legal correspondent for CNN or something who's been mentioned. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, you take, yeah, look oh, at that. Proud of her. Yeah, hold on. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I think I must have missed that one. She's in the, she's in the story. Let me look up. Uh, Laura Coates. Yeah, it's her name. Oh, really? Laura Coates? Ooh, Lord. Yeah, oh, you know, yeah, you know, dude. Hell yeah. <laughs> See, <man. laughs> yeah I, didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know what? Scrap the whole thing with that hologram. Uh, <laughs> you know, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I didn't know that. I, I, I missed that one. Wow, Laura Coates. Okay. Hey. Yeah. And, a, and another sure. high profile name, which I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for this one, but they mentioned George Stephanopoulos. And no. Man, you know, I, yeah, I don't know why he would want to take that job, but I, I wouldn't want someone who's trying to be the head news guy on ABC to yeah. be on Jeopardy as well. Like, you got to pick one or the other. I'm all down for a woman for sure. If it's not going to be Ken, uh, I, I like Laura Coates. Okay, so, um, <laughs> uh, but that'd be good. That'd be that's cool. cool. Yeah, yeah dude, yes, it did. <laughs> um, I'm, I'll be all down for a woman doing it for sure, for sure. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think when it comes to minds like, okay, yeah, Ken Jennings and my, you know, crazy idea just having like, you know, keep Al Shebeck there with a hologram style and stuff. But having a woman, man, listen, that'd be great too. I mean, having somebody young enough that's probably like in their 30s or 40s, maybe about 40s, but like that. Because how was Al Shebeck? Like 80? Was he close? Yeah, to 80. He passed with 80. He did the show for like 37 years. So he was, Hey, why he not was, have a why, yeah. yeah, why not have a woman on there doing the same thing for like another 30 or 30 years, whatever like that, you know? Uh I'm all for it. I'm all for it. They yeah. just gotta it's gonna be hard, some hard shoes to fill, man. Oh hard yeah, shoes, big shoes to fill. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And and that, that brings me to something, one more point I wanted to make, because this was something I was actually thinking about bringing on the show a couple weeks ago. When I heard that John Stewart was going to come back on television on uh, Apple TV, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about him, and I was thinking about uh, David Letterman, who is on the Netflix show now, mm -hmm. and how like you have all these 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 people who become institutions on television now, 
and nobody stays away. They're all like too short now. They can't stop rapping. You know, <laughs> you know? nobody said like the last dude who really did that is like Carson, Johnny Carson. When he retired in 92, he never did another TV show. Nope. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be the last guy who gets down like that. Like, like you say, let him. I thought Letterman would have chill, but Letterman came back and, you know, John Stewart's coming back. And, and it did, but, but to that degree, you look at how, um, uh, Trebet never, he never laid back. Like, even though he was stricken with cancer and everything, he worked up until his death. Yeah, man. And, you know, you got, you know, you definitely got to give him his props for that. But, you know, it shows how, how the game is now and how people sort of approach these things now is sort of different than where they used to be. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I definitely agree. Uh, it's too much money out there, man. It's too many, it's too many platforms and it's too, many, too much money. How many channels? Yeah. What, when, when did Johnny Carson uh, leave? What year was it? 90 what? 92, I think. 92. So what? You just you probably just had Fox come around. Cable was still, I mean, cable had been around for like what maybe 20 years. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe less than that, really. Right, less than that. Cable been around for less than that. Really, the internet hasn't exploded the way that it did. I was it wasn't everybody's homes, so you didn't have the platforms. He had no other choice. If Johnny if Johnny Carson was alive right now, he would have left the left a late late night show with tonight show. I'm sure he would have been on Twitch or some shit. I mean, you know, <laughs> he would have been on something. It's just it's, it's it's too it's too many platforms. It's too many platforms for you not to be able to do. Hell, YouTube, what we're doing right now, Streamyard. You know, it's just it's yeah. it's too much. And if somebody come with you with that bag, I mean, yeah. David Letterman, like he just rolled out of a garbage can. How much you giving me? All right, cool. And David, David Letterman is one of the greatest of all time. You know what I'm saying? If right. not, you know what I'm saying? He's right up there with Johnny Carson. It might be one, two. You never know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're talking to. That's so, how I put it. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you have the money, the guys are gonna do it, man. They got, they're gonna do it. That's Women true. and men, they're gonna do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, to that degree, let's let's wrap up with some TV recommendations. I wanna I'm gonna put one out connected mm. to Letterman. Uh there's a mini series out about this uh this nightclub. This comedy club called the Comedy Store, mm. and uh, it's on Showtime. I would recommend that uh, it's a five-part series. It's directed by a guy named Mike Bender, who uh, is a, a, a film director, but he used to he started out as a comedian at the Comedy Store, and I mentioned that because Letterman did that as well. A lot of people don't know Letterman started uh, started as a stand-up. He actually was mm -hmm. a, a, a a weatherman in Indianapolis, he moved out to LA and became a stand up. And he got in good with, with Johnny Carson on the on the Tonight Show. He uh, did stand up on there, wound up being a guest host. Mm -hmm. And that led to him getting his own show with NBC. And uh, it's a lot of history with the comedy store. Like we mentioned prior, prior, that was his home for a while as a stand up. Jimmy Walker, uh, uh, John Witherspoon, um, all like you could reel off a lot of great names. Jay Leno started there, man. A lot of great mm -hmm. people started at the comedy store, and uh, this this documentary series really goes into the. It just goes to the whole history about the club, how it started. Pauly Shore, his mama was the was the owner of of the uh, Mitzi Shore. She was the owner of the store. Really? And, uh, yeah. I didn't so know that. If you're if you're into stand up comedy at all, like watch that show, and um, you know you learn a lot about the history of, of stand up comedy in that. So I definitely recommend that. Right. What channel was on? On Showtime. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Showtime uh, putting out some decent stuff. I want. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm gonna check out that John. I still ain't check out the John Brown show yet, but I'm gonna check it out. I know uh, our guy Ken has recommended it. But I'm gonna check that out soon. I think the the first series, the first season, is just wrapped up with that. Okay, John Brown. What's what's what was that? That's the the good. What is it? What is it that? The Good Lord Bird, I believe, is the name of the show. Is that the one with Devon Diggs is playing? Um, uh, Frederick. Yeah, Douglas? He's, he's playing Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Okay, I, I've Lord seen Bird. that. Okay, cool. All right, I, I do want to check that out. I haven't checked it out yet. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, have you been watching anything interesting, man? 
I haven't been watching too much TV lately. Uh, Even at the polls, at the polls, man. The <laughs> news over the last several hours of the day since mm. this morning, but I do know one show I do want to check out is uh Fargo on FX. Yeah, with Chris Rock, that's something I definitely got to catch up on. Yeah, yeah. DVR for sure. There's so many shows that I typically watch, like Snowfall and stuff that's been uh, halted by COVID. I can't wait till that come back on, but. Uh, I've been yeah. so caught up with the NBA news over the last several hours, man. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gabe, Gabe, let, let's tell them about what you do, man. Normally, you you uh you write a lot about uh you write on Hoops Habit, uh the website Hoops Habit contribute to that. Uh, you, I know you do a lot of work with the Rockets, and uh some some interesting stuff is popping up with the Rockets. Mm, uh, yeah. They maybe getting rid of one or two of their big guys, man, Westbrook and Harden, but uh. In general, man, what what you been thinking about the NBA right now and how it's transitioning? They the the new season's gonna come up quick, and and the the draft is uh, this coming Wednesday now, man. Well, what's your thoughts on all that? Well, I mean, anytime that money's involved, it's always gonna talk. Um, I, I'm excited to see it though, nonetheless. I'm interested to see how various teams that have been off for over several months. Uh, adjust and adapt to the rigors of a 72 game workload season where the margin for error will be a tad bit smaller and I'm also in- interested to see just how the free agency period works I think we got a preview of it during the 2011-12 lockout season mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a lot of willing and dealing I think moves have already been done and that's why you're seeing so much talk and, and, and channels uh, across various places it's, it's going to be very intriguing to see. And of course, what happens in Houston, I definitely have my eyes on that one. Uh, the who, who do you think is more likely to be dealt between Westbrook and Harden? Westbrook. Yeah. Um, James Harden has the key to that city. James Harden <laughs> is Houston, uh, in my eyes. And for them to lose Harden, I, I know that it's a possibility, especially with his contract coming up um, in the next couple of years. But I do think that he'll seek to give Steven Silas a chance and having a familiarity with certain figures in that organization um, will make him at least give them a chance and play this process out over the next year as they seek to try and win a championship with him as their uh, de facto face of the franchise. D, we, we was talking on – they was talk, we, we didn't really get involved, but they was talking on, the, uh, on our, our most active – the mm-hmm. text line about Westbrook mm-hmm. early today, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, somebody I think Mel brought him up coming to Chicago, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no, had that one, uh, that text scene, and had the one with uh, Sean and Anton, uh, other guys. Shout out to them, and they always like keep his ass away from here. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I just don't, I just don't know where Westbrook will be able to uh, utilize his abilities and his talent unless it is a contender but then like I, I, one of my guys like brought up uh miami i was like nah you need to leave miami where they are right now that you the, obviously houston gonna ask for all their shooters they good young shooters and in, in order to get them uh, to get him uh and that's not gonna work i think miami is fine the way they are honestly i think miami probably gonna be the cream of the crop in the east next year as long yeah. as everybody's healthy and it's gonna be a shortened season again uh, probably going to be back down in Walt Disney World. I don't know what's going to happen with COVID because it was reported today 140,000 people was affected. So I don't know how that's going to shape out the season as well. Um, but I don't know, man. I feel I, I do feel bad for uh, Westbrook because he's such an exceptional talent, like a once, gener- once in a generational talent. He, he is that, but he hasn't been able to find his home to win a championship. I, I kind of like put him and Chris Paul in the same category. I think Westbrook is far talented, more talented than Chris Paul. Chris Paul does what he, they're both Hall of Famers, but Chris Paul does what he does very well. Westbrook can just do everything, right? But he hasn't mm-hmm. been able to find a home where he can do it to go to the next level win a championship. And any team that's going to trade from, I, I'm guessing, is going to be a contender. So you got to think, okay, so, you know, is this going to be the same thing that happened in Houston? Houston was a contender. They should have been able to get to the final step with him, and they haven't been able to. So I don't know what's going to be in his future. I um, I think one of my buddies brought up Charlotte, 
Charlotte finished, what, 10th in the East? But they were 10 games behind the last place of the eighth seed. Do you think Russell Westbrook will be able to push that, push Charlotte into the last spot? You know Michael Jordan loves him. Is he willing to give up the number three overall pick to, for Westbrook and some other pieces trying to make it work? I don't know. It's 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 if it's true what's coming out that he wants to leave, it's gonna be interesting to see where he goes and what that other team gives up. And will it just be another case of Houston? You know, yeah. all part of the reason why he wanna leave too is because he knows that he wants to play with the ball in his hand. I think that was one of the biggest issues was the fact that it was I always looked at the Westbrook Harden tandem as an, a one year experiment. And I think they did, too, whereas yeah. they, they were best friends. They always wanted to play together, and they had that opportunity that just so came up when Paul George got traded from Oklahoma City to L.A., and I don't think the marketplace was really that great for him at the time due to his contract, and it still isn't. However, if it's one thing that Chris Paul's contract has shown me and various other players, including Blake Griffin, is that no contract in the NBA is untradeable. Right. I think what the Rockets right. are seeking to do is they're trying to find a big man that they can incorporate within this new regime and system. Uh, when James Harden was at his best, it was always in that pick and roll, one two-man game with Clint Capella. I think he's looking for a big man who could be a Capella-like player, but also play in a pick and pop game with him and help space the floor and knock down open shots from the perimeter, which is something that he's never had in Houston. And mm -hmm. I think that's going to be one of the pieces that they look for. And I think they're going to try and get some draft pick compensation for Russ well, as well, in addition to a young piece or two. I don't know if Russ goes to a contender. I know for a fact that I think Russ would like to go to a contender, of course, his age, his career. But when you make this type of request saying that you want out, yeah. it, it diminishes your value. Yeah. And yeah. what you know happens remains to be seen, but it's obvious that it's gonna be a lot of changes in Houston, and that's been obvious ever since Dan Tony stepped down. Yep. Um, Daryl Boyd decided to part ways with the organization and so forth. And so they're always gonna be a team that's in the news, and like I always say, everything is big in Texas, and I think that's how they like it down there. That's why I brought up that's why I brought up Charlotte. I mean, they're not a contender per se, but mm -hmm. they have a high draft pick. Michael Jordan is willing to do any damn thing. You know, he give him a few cigars and a drink. And they need a star. You know, yeah. huh? what'd you say? They need a star to sell tickets. They need yeah. a star to sell tickets. It's been a major they issue sure with yeah, well, right. it be Like you said, while they not, they may not be a contender, they may be a Westbrook away from the playoffs at least. And yeah, it's that's enough. That's yeah, enough it's for possible. them. Yeah. yeah so. I mean, it was, uh, who was the last place? Who made the AFC this year? It was Orlando. The, Orlando. Orlando, Orlando, right, and it was um, it, who, I forgot who was number nine, but I know Houston. I mean, San Antonio. I mean, uh, Charlotte was number ten. I'm going. Who I'm blanking? No, uh, the Wizards were nine. Number nine. Number nine. Yeah. 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 Yes. The Remember Wizards. the Wizards. The Wizards played themselves behind the Bulls in the bubble because <laughs> they, oh, yeah. the they lost every game yep. in the bubble. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. played they sure themselves did. behind the Bulls <laughs> and, yep. and one other team. I think it might have. Been Charlotte. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people I mean, didn't even think they deserved to be in the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, they didn't. Of course they didn't. <laughs> I mean, but you you have somebody like Charlotte. You have, I know Washington been wanting to move. I think Bill wants to move, but they want to move Bill. You see what Washington is able to do. They was a ninth seed. Uh, I don't know what's happening really happening in Detroit. They probably going through a full rebuild. Uh well, he says probably That's should start it. Yeah, you really? probably and because Blake, because Blake is Blake coming back this season? Is he going to be healthy for this upcoming season? So, I think yeah, he he'll be healthy, but I I can see that because for one, when it comes to team needs, the Rockets are looking to boost their front court. Mm -hmm. Detroit is looking for a face to sell tickets. They're also yeah. looking for a point guard and yeah. a star point guard at that. And Russell yeah. Westbrook checks those boxes. It, it's, it's not really a great situation for him. I can see a team like Orlando possibly. Well, I was going to bring them up too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because they, they need to sell tickets and they need a superstar face, something that yeah. they have not had since the Dwight Howard era. Uh huh. Well, you, you know, y'all mentioned y'all mentioned tickets. It just came to my mind how much financial reasoning may play into decisions mm -hmm. coming up with NBA teams because of yep. the, we already heard that they lost hundreds of million dollars from the past season. 
and they're going to lose more money because they're not going to have uh, crowds, definitely not to capacity. They, they should Maybe not any crowds coming up for this season. They're going to try to play in their individual arenas, but they're not going to have crowds. So they're going to – a lot of money factors are going to be factor. It's going to be uh, prominent within these teams. You, you got to figure with – with these moves in the in the near future, yeah, well, they, just can, announced they, today, can, they just announced today that they want to have some crowds that maybe like twenty five to fifty percent capacity in some areas of the arena. I don't <laughs> think that works. I don't like it, but it is. I do know for a fact a lot of owners lost money. A lot of oh, owners, oh yeah, they, yeah. Pacers, Tillman Fertitta definitely lost a lot of money with the Rockets, and he's facing a, a tremendous amount of pressure from the fan base to live up to the words in which he, you know echoed out a couple years back that, hey, I want to be a guy that spends over the luxury tax and helps James Harden win the championship. Fans remember that, and they want to know whether or not you're going to put your money where your mouth is. And then with the salary cap being lowered down, like right now, from where I look at it from a financial standpoint, the Rockets are a luxury tax team with the cap being at yeah. around $132 million. So it's going to be a lot of teams with incentive to spend, if not incentive to at least get a star to attract revenue at the gate whether they can get any little or, or big yeah and there may be teams that cheapen out <coughs> bulls yeah uh, <laughs> And probably do some stuff on the cheap side too. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's definitely gonna it's definitely gonna uh we're definitely gonna see what they could do because as you said with the money wise so is it is can a small market team afford to keep James Harden? You know what I'm saying? Are we going to see one of these shenanigans where it's kind of like three a three team or four team trade to kind of just move pieces around because you have to think about money? It's 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 a it's a it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. Um, I will say for the fans down in Houston, and I know you're right from them, brother. Uh, <laughs> I know that Fertilla said that talking about he was willing to spend. Listen, man, Texas is going through a thing. It's a million y'all down there with COVID, <laughs> so you might want to hold off. <laughs> Can't have everything you want right now. <laughs> you can't have everything. So uh I don't know. It's 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 gonna be fun. I'm just I'm just happy that the NBA is uh is coming back. Uh it's kind of weird now with so many cases popping yeah. up. Uh I don't know they, if it's they were be- really they were really ideal in the way that they dealt with the with COVID over the summer. Yeah, but they was in one spot. Yeah, I'm saying that yeah, yeah it, it was in one they, spot. But I, that's what I'm saying. I hope that they don't undercut that with Trying too hard to get back on on the calendar. So yeah. I, I, I would think I would think if if you want to do it and you want to you, you can't occupy Mickey Mouse house for a longer period of time. Like damn, y'all back already? If you don't want to do that, at least have it satellite spots throughout the country. If you want to like three do or four, it, yeah. If you want to do it, okay, you get you up in Oak. Well, is it? Are they in San Francisco? Or are they still in Oakland? The war in San Francisco, not the, the in San Francisco right? Maybe. Okay, so yeah. you want to do it in San Fran, you want to do it down in LA. That's fine. You do, you know, what I'm saying like we have what is it six divisions? You know, what I'm saying just have like maybe two spots for each division or something like that. You could figure some some way out because as we see with the NFL and at the start of MLB, these cats ain't just ain't going home and just ain't chilling. So Lou Williams down there against the Wayne's going to see some strippers, they gonna be out and about. <laughs> You got to keep these cats can kind of confined if you want to be able to finish the season. And kudos to the NBA for doing it, but they was in one spot. They can't like, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, have everybody come to our arena. For what? I mean, we're probably going to be in lockdown the next couple of weeks. It, and, and the NBA starts up in, what, six weeks? So I think the yeah, draft is next seconds. week, right? Yeah. yeah so next week. Yeah, so you you I hope they understand, and it seems as if they are they, the NBA is a forward forward thinking league. Not all the owners, but collectively, you got enough of people to kind of push it to be a forward leaning for forward leaning league. Uh, but I hope they do that because if you just got these cats just willy nilly flying around here and there, I mean, they go somebody gonna catch COVID. And it's and a, a few. Like, Rockets, I mean, a Raptors player right now, not knowing where you're gonna play because they're still yeah. trying to find out where they're gonna play. Can right? they're being restricted from the Canadian government. Uh, yeah. they're restricting U.S. teams from coming in there. 
So Justin, that, Justin that, Trudeau don't want our asses right. up there. Justin Trudeau <laughs> don't want our asses up there. Right. You keep That's y'all right. COVID asses down. <laughs> yeah. You got you gonna have the, the, the rappers gonna end up playing in the KFC Yum Center in Louisville. You know, exactly. City somewhere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I hope that I mean, be a perfect example. All right, Toronto, you're gonna be playing in New York, you're gonna be playing at the garden. You know what I'm saying? You know, you can kind of contain it and just kind of hopefully limit their accessibility of getting outside and moving around and doing what young what, what young men do. Uh, but if they make satellite spots throughout the country for the divisions, maybe to a conference, they could probably pull it off. They could probably pull it off. But that's that's just my man. I do have yeah, a, yeah. I do have a TV uh-huh. show too. Okay, this is this is this is old. Not old. It's only one year old. Uh, Gab, I love history, right? I'm a history dude. I love politics. I used to do a sports show for like 15 years. Uh, Kyle produced it. So, you know, that's why I can run my mouth. <laughs> I have been checking out because oh, I think we talked about this before. Remember on a history channel, they had the, the men that built America. Okay. That Carnegie Hall and all this before like that. So I finally found it. I've been searching for this. I didn't want to pay anything extra for the History Channel, whatever the stream, whatever the case may be, um, they had the the food that built America. Uh, so yeah, had, yeah, I've, seen I've been before. I've been searching this damn show like the big great whale, and I finally <laughs> found the son of a bitch. It's on Hulu, and uh, it is amazing. It's amazing. I hate the fact that it's not uh, black folks in. There's no black folks, <laughs> but uh, only thing black is there is the Hershey chocolate. Um, but you they don't have like no soul food or nothing in it. Nothing, nothing like this. Is how they made hog molds. No, they had nothing like collard greens. <laughs> they ain't had nothing about that. They have they didn't have no shit like that for us. But it is amazing. Um, the stories about how uh, Milton Hershey start Hershey candy. Um, the story how that t- that intertwined with um the Mars son and father and son how they started Mars candy. Uh, post. Post ripped off cereal, stole the idea from cereal from the Kellogg brothers. And this dude was like, I don't want to say he was in an insane asylum, but he was like in his medical re- rehab joint. And it was giving these, they was giving these folks like, like real quick. They would like back in the like early 1900s, they would advertise some wild ass shit. Like this piece of chocolate is uh has more nutrition, nu- uh, nutrients than a steak. And they would just put the shit out there and people would believe it. I mean, they you had didn't have to clear yourself with the yeah, FDA, right? Right, but they did talk about how they how the FDA was uh invented, though. It, 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 that kind of tied into it, too. Where well, they had a they had a candy bar called the chicken dinner. It's like, well, goddamn, they were dumb back then, but anyway, I mean, don't we dumb now, too? But they basically he basically was in this uh, uh rehab facility, so they was eating this grains or whatever, like breaking it up and was feeding it to the people because the Kellogg the, the, the Kellogg brother that was a doctor thought that it helped cure cure them or some shit but he was like man this shit tastes good all you gotta do is put milk in it hold on let me steal this and the recipe and I'm gonna go make my own and the brother made grape nuts and <laughs> that's how and a war started between the Kellogg's and the Post it's a wild shit man it's really really good so anybody out there that has Hulu um, it's called the food that America built. I'm on now the story of Colonel Sanders. This mother out here shooting people. It's, it's just it's amazing. <laughs> Frying chicken in the back of a gas station out here shooting folks. So um, it's amazing. So if anybody ever get a chance, if you have Hulu, check out the food that America built. I this, would check that out. Yeah. Yeah, if you just into history, if you just into history, um, and just want to, you know, saying. It's just interesting because you never think about when you pick up a piece of candy, how it started or who started it, you know, or how did they figure out how to freeze food? And they have they talk about that, you know, saying how the food, how the food industry kind of like birthed uh, or how one person birthed how a a frozen food is sold. So it's very interesting, very interesting. I definitely recommend that. But you know another thing that's on Hulu. I haven't I actually haven't watched it yet, but I, it's relevant to us in Chicago. Is that city so real series that uh Steve James did? Mm, you ain't hear about that, Jay? Lamar? No. Oh. Yeah, a uh, documentary series that uh, uh I think it was produced by National Geographic, but it's on Hulu. I'm surprised oh, you ain't really? seen it. Yeah, no. it's on Hulu. 
What is it called again? Like City So Real. It's basically depicting Chicago from when uh, Lori Lightfoot got elected up until uh, through to to through the rioting and stuff. From, from oh, the really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. I check it out. City So Real. So, right. yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm gonna start looking at that soon myself and try to incorporate that into some future shows. But uh, yeah, yeah, I we got a two hour show, our first two hour show. <laughs> we we did a lot of talking, and I appreciate Dave couldn't hold on. Uh, he had some technical issues, but I thank you, brothers, for uh, bringing the heat tonight, man. Gabe, I got to get you on a uh, NBA show. We gonna start picking that up soon. Running with war. Uh, um, I'm gonna definitely get you on this soon, and um, uh, like I said, the, you know, we said the draft coming up, the new season coming up, so a lot of stuff coming up with the NBA. So we're gonna get that going. And D, uh, you say you want to, you say you want to go back into hibernation. So I'm going back into hibernation. Let you chill. Yeah, I'm <laughs> gonna chill for a while. Maybe I yeah, might I pop up the show yeah. next year. Oh yeah, anything yeah. for you, Cuzzo. Anything. For I appreciate me. you uh, coming in for the past few weeks and holding the, holding me down, man. Yeah, and anything for you, cousin. You know it's love right there, man. Yeah, man. So, uh, me on, Cal. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, you you a great guy, man. Let anybody know how they could uh, reach you or follow you, uh, whatever. You know, keep in touch with what you you doing online and stuff. Perfect, man. You can follow me at G Time underscore one uh, at G Time underscore the number one on Twitter. Uh, that's why I do most of my talking and stuff. And whenever I share any type of you know stuff I got going on, um, I let people know through there. And uh, you can also check me out at hoopshabit.com slash author slash G Wilkins for any um upcoming Rockets material and stuff that I got going on over there. Definitely. Definitely follow him if you went to the NBA and, and into those Rockets, man. Definitely follow Gabe. Yes, yes, no doubt. And you can, everybody can follow me on Twitter right there, Demons one D-E-M-O-N-Z-E-1. I'm on there talking stuff, usually politics or uh not so much sports because I done, I didn't divorce myself from it. I ain't gotta follow it on more. They ain't gotta they ain't gonna be pissing me off all the time running my blood pressure up. So I know, you, I, I know you've been been pissed off the past couple of days too. Oh my time. god, that damn Tom, uh, La Rosa, Tony La, La, I mean uh, Tony La Rosa. Man, listen, let me hold on real quick, real quick. But hey, we gonna call them bubbles. Bubble. I, call them bubbles. This is. Real quick, you let me hop on the side soapbox before we go. <laughs> go ahead. I don't. I mean, I understand what's happening. You have Jerry Reinsdorf, who does not care what anybody says. He's gonna do what he's gonna do. It's kind of like I know people are upset, but you gotta understand who's doing, it, who's making you upset. Um, I don't think Tony Tony is gonna step down. I don't think Tony Larusso is gonna step down at all. His homeboy just gave him a job when he was out there uh, doing God knows what in Arizona. Um, but I, I don't understand. It's going to be a fallout. I just, I'm just not sure as to who's going to jump ship. Because you have players on the contract and they sign these guys. So they obviously got to be there for a particular time. I don't know what's Maybe going on. looking at Rick Hahn. Exactly. Kenny and Rick are the two dominoes that I'm looking at. Unless something like just outlandish comes out about Tony Larusa, he's not going anywhere, right? And Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't care. That's his guy. He's trying to make up his past failures back in the early 18, 19, I mean, 19, I was say 1880 shit, 1980s. <laughs> Might as well be. Might as well be, right. <laughs> Thank you, Cuzzo. Uh, he's trying to make up for his failures uh, by him firing him and him and then Tony going off and winning three World Series championships. Um, but Kenny and Rick are the dominoes. I'm. I don't think Kenny's going to go anywhere because Kenny doesn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really Rick number one and Kenny number two because this is like a publicity nightmare that they're going through. But I'm not shocked that the owner is going to dig in his heels. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when it comes to free agency, and I'm not talking about free agents, free agents coming into the White Sox. I'm talking about guys who are going to have their contracts up and be like, deuces. I don't well, want we, we had already Marcus Stroman. Oh, yeah. Who yeah, but you got to think. He, he, he may not have been in play anyway. Right. But 
But he right. but he made the statement though online. He said he, he would did. never play for him. He did. So and you, you don't, don't there are others who could feel that way. Right. And you don't want that as any kind of franchise. I don't care. I don't care. You don't want that as a corner store down the street on the block. I ain't fucking with them. You know what I'm right. saying? You don't, you don't want that anywhere, right? So yes, that was a shot. But like I said before, you got to understand who you're dealing with. And that shot is gonna go into like a fart in the you know saying in the in the in the forest, man. Ain't nobody gonna hear that shit. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 nothing to him. It's nothing to Jerry Reinsdorf. So I'm looking more so at Rick and I'm looking more at Kenny and I'm looking at the guys that's on the roster right now. I think yeah. the season's gonna start. And it all depends on how good they do. Tony La Russa is a great manager. He's a Hall of Famer. I'll, the biggest contention is can he relate to these guys right now? But yeah. if he's giving them the X and the O's and they're succeeding, what's the what's the phrase? The uh the, the best deodorant for losing is winning, right? You start winning, yeah. they're gonna be like, hey, we all good. So the season's gonna start. I just want to see how, like, maybe the first quarter of the season go. Cause they lose a PR battle now, but they don't care, right? Let's see how that first quarter of the season goes if they're winning and they're clicking and it doesn't seem that any kind of rifts are happening yeah. it's going to play out so you got to see how it how it first starts you got to see that, that you gotta start. it has to start first it has to start yeah. first there have been situations like that before where you've had teams that have won in spite of their managers yeah. and yep. teams that sort of formulated their own chemistry separate from the management. Right. And that may be something that has to happen with the Sox, unfortunately, because, you know, it, it, they, I don't think they, they have gotten the support that they needed by this decision being made. The fan and, base uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's infuriating and it's infuriating a lot of the Sox uh, fans. You look at high profile fans like Lawrence Holmes, talking mm-hmm. about he's giving up his, uh, he's he's just, he's tickets and stuff, and this is, I, I just don't understand why, as a franchise, you would allow something like this to be about it. But you know, I'm just I just hope that Larusa don't take a, a, a couple sniffs of old granddad and, and get on the damn ride, you know. Because Timmy, you know, what are you, you know, doing, boy? I see you through that fan one more time. <laughs> we don't need him on the damn ride. With, yeah. with, 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 Ah. Swerving, man. You know, you gotta chill, man. Yeah, you, you gotta lie. Yeah, you just yeah. gotta see, but you gotta see what happens. It's gonna start. It's gonna start. You just yeah. gotta see what happens. If they start winning, ain't nobody gonna care. If they and spring start, training is gonna be very know. interesting too. Spring training is very interesting because for the first time you're gonna he's gonna have to own up and and, and fess up and talk with the media, which is yeah. something that He's been very quiet about doing since his introductory press conference. He hasn't gotten in the know with Tim Anderson and Eloy and none of the guys on the team. That spring dude. training is going to be very, very interesting to watch from a media perspective. That's and why I, I said I was, you got to look at the guys on the roster. They haven't even reached out. To, Jose Abreu, I don't think he – he didn't win an MVP, right? Mm, I don't think they announced it. announced it. Okay. Announced it. My, my brother is up for an MVP. Possibly he's probably going to win it. And you ain't called him yet? I mean, what's going on yeah. here? So that's why my, my third domino is kind of like, okay, yeah, what is they want to deal with the translator. He said, I don't want to deal with a damn translator. Jerry, that wasn't part of the deal. I ain't speaking no Spanish. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, You're right, you right, though. This is a special team, potentially. Yeah. And they weren't be, they weren't factored in on the decision making. He didn't. They, he could have gave a damn. He just wanted to do like you said. The wanted to. He wants to relive the mid eighties and and make make good on a on a mistake that he Hawk Harrison made that mistake. Okay, Hawk Harrison gone, and, and we have to we have to live through this because of something that Hawk Harrison did. Yeah, but, but he, but still though, he. I mean, I know Jerry kind of lets it let his his front office do whatever they want to do. I get that. I do get that. But at the same time, you're the damn owner, you know. Yeah. And, and, and where are you? Yeah, none where are this, you? None of this should be. Yeah, let's see, none of this should have gone down. At the least, you could have had him come in as a as an advisor. That's what he was doing with the yeah, Arizona. Angels or yeah. Arizona. Yeah, he did it with the Angels, the Red Sox, the Diamondbacks. He's worked is in a front office role over the last ten years. He he hasn't walked away from the game at right. all. Like he's been involved. He just hasn't been in the dugout in the last nine years. And the last time yeah. he was in the dugout 
Tim Anderson was in junior college. Lucas Giolito was was in high school, I believe. So, like, it, this roster isn't really familiar with him. And the game, in some aspects, has passed him by. But I think one thing that would be very, very intriguing to see as well when it comes to La Russa, and I can understand why it was an attractive job to him. You think about the oh, absolutely Oakland and St. Louis, but think about this too. Oakland, he won a championship. St. Louis, he won two championships. Chicago is the only place that he's never won a championship. And when you got your good buddy calling you, asking you, you know, do you want to come aboard and, and help me get this, this World Series back here in, on the south side, I can see how that's intriguing, especially when it didn't work out for you with the winning ugly team in 83, which was 10 years before I was born. So right. I get it. Yeah. And he was yeah, 10 years before he was born. One year before me. Yeah. 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 No, I know. I, I mean, I was I was one. But OK, whatever. <laughs> I mean, whatever. I mean, but yeah, I, I agree with you, Gabe. Gabe. Um, yeah, if he's able to kind of like, oh man, I'm able to come back to where it all started, started and win a championship. I mean, that's great. And listen, the White Sox are a potential World Series team. They might be like yeah. maybe one, two pieces away. It could be somewhere internally, or you might be able to sign somebody that be like, I like Tony. You know what I'm saying? So you might be able to get that. And if and it's very, very uh intriguing to kind of come back and be able to uh, at least do it. I don't know mm. if it's gonna work. <laughs> right. I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's gonna work. I don't know how. It, yeah. yeah, I don't know how these guys are going to react to it, but it has to start. Like a lot of people saying, like, man, fire him now. That's not going to happen. Exactly. You're going to see, you're going to see this. You're going to see the start of this movie. Mm-hmm. We just don't know how it's going to end, but yeah. you are going to see the start of it. So just got to sit back. Like I, me and Tony got tickets for next season. You know, I'm guessing if we you able to. <laughs> yeah, we we have, it, instead of like just taking the money back, we was like, forget it. We just we, if you're gonna push us over the next season, we come next season. All right, fine, we're gonna do it because the team is great. The team yeah. is great, so I'm I don't want to miss out on the possibility of them basically flipping the birds to their manager, going out there and winning and going to the World Series. I don't want to miss that. So and, yeah. they, work, and they got my money. So I'll I'll leave it at this. You know, it, it may it may play a negative role in the team uh, you know, development next year. But I think we're within our rights as fans and the media and, and especially in Chicago is within their rights to uh, keep pressure on the Sox, uh, mm-hmm. in particular management, yeah. uh, the upper management. And, you know, like I say, ask questions of La Russa, stay on his, stay on him when it comes to his ability to maintain his personal life. And, you know, ask questions whenever possible to Reinsdorf and and Hahn and Kenny Williams. And just like, look, look this thing happened. It, it affected a lot of people. It was done unilaterally. You know, you got to speak truth yeah. to power in that way. And, you know, hopefully hopefully it don't negatively affect the team to a point where they they come out in a slump or they have a or they underperform next year. But. I think, like I said, well, I think we're well within our rights to question this team going forward in the way that it's being ran because what they did, right? What they did with this hire potentially is a is a big setback, yeah. especially when you make promises to the fan base. Like Rick Hahn yeah. has been very adamant about being a man of his word, and he was developing a lot of great credibility among Chicago sports fans. Yeah. And yep. to go out here and say we're going to get a manager who has won recently got into a World Series recently and, and knows how to relate to our players, knows how to speak, you know, foreign languages such as Spanish and adapt with this clubhouse, this young locker room that we have, and to get a guy that's been away from the dugout for nine years, albeit is one of the winning his manager's baseball history. Like, that's... Already a Hall of Famer, but... Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, 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 and as, he, as he told the police officer, I'm in Hall of Fame, bro. Hall of Fame, brother. <laughs> Hall of Fame, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody say he's Hulk Hogan, <laughs> right? <laughs> but and, and that's to that degree. That's why Han, you know, you could think about him being willing to jump ship because he still has a career yeah. that he yeah. needs he's to still think young. of. Yeah, Kenny Williams, he he done pretty much with his career. Mm-hmm. Rick Han, like you say, Gabe, he had to go back on his word because his owner trumped him and re and uh, acted uh, unilaterally. 
and made him go back on his word. So if he's in a position where that's where he, that's where he's being treated and he's not being trusted to make those type of decisions, he needs to go to another team where he could be more empowered. And and he's shown that he could build up a, a franchise, yes, build yeah. up a, a, a farm system, and make a team and rebuild a, a bad uh, a team at the at the major league level. So he could have his pick of jobs out there. It wouldn't uh, be so Chicago if he went to the Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something that could happen too soon where, uh, you know, uh, 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 Theo could move to a higher position, Hoyer but could move up and they could, and, uh, you know, uh, he could, like, Han could get into Hoyer's position right now. Yeah. So it, or or Theo position or whatever, you know, he could, that could definitely happen. Yeah. We shall yeah. see. Yeah, we'll see. But thanks, brothers. I really appreciate y'all. Glad we do some good old sports talk before the end here. Yeah, yeah, no and, doubt. Uh, yeah we like I said we'll keep up uh they'll keep up with all everything these brothers do. Keep up with us, war media, we are radio.com, war on anchor, uh, and everything, war media on all the major platforms, uh, Facebook, uh, IG, Twitter. And uh, me, K, K Mean on IG, uh, we are uh, work underscore right on Twitter. So, uh, yeah, just uh, keep keep rocking with us, and uh, we'll keep bringing more of this good stuff. We may be back uh, with this show next week, either Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm still going over that. And, um, but we'll be back next week with more in the building. Though. Yeah, that's it for now, though. Uh, they said keep rocking in the free world with Trump <laughs> losing – more and more lawsuits every day. I won all oh, the votes. I already won. Uh, I'm going to I won. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Peace, brothers. All yeah. right. Peace. Good to meet you, guys. Yeah, nice meeting you, Demonza.